Okay, let's get started. time again it's that time what yeah turtle time right (laughs) that's right (laughs) turtle time the time of the week when you and i get together to talk about everything in the bravo universe yep right (laughs) every week (laughs) every single week um so can i ask how's your week been since i last saw you it's been good um we were just talking about that i took uh the weekend off of alcohol last weekend so i feel refreshed and uh productive and clean so friday and saturday yeah it's been i think i'm gonna drink again (laughs) tomorrow or as you're listening today friday it'll be have been two weeks okay so when you're listening to this picture amy just hours from whenever you listen to it she probably will have either gotten drunk or getting (laughs) drunk right on that day currently guzzling i'm gonna yeah i'm gonna guzzle too on Friday, but I've also been withdrawing from drinking as yeah. part of a dry January, mm-hmm. except last night. I had three margaritas, <laughs> so that broke the, the dry January pretty distinctly. Yeah. Were they like sugary? No, actually. Oh, they were They good? were more like, they felt good quality and not sugary, like okay. big pours. That's surprising. And, and almost on the, on the scale of too much tequila, they were almost bordering on that to where mm-hmm. I would have asked them for more sugary mix. Do you want to tell people where you were drinking the margarita? Sure. The reason why I broke my dry January was because the fact that I got to go to the Vanderpump Rules season 11 premiere. And as part of the premiere, they had unlimited alcohol for anybody who wanted to drink as much as they could drink. And I thought, (laughs) what the hell am I doing? You know, I should have honored dry January, obviously. But it was too enticing to not, you know, I mean, that's like... They're offering free drinks, <laughs> you know, yeah. fifteen dollar cocktails potentially, and yeah. I just so I just thought that this this environment was too much to not to to waste that opportunity, and so I I'm still gonna continue on Dry January, but um, I just had to do it. I yeah. wanted to chug margaritas and be surrounded by the Vanderpump Rules cast members and yeah, be drunk as hell. I mean, historically, I would say I don't prefer to be sober in a Vanderpump environment. Right. Um, but remember, fatefully, the time that the night of Scandaval, when Ariana found Tom's phone, I had driven to Tom Tom that night and was like trying to play it easy. So I had only had like one glass of wine that night. So I remember it all. Clear eyes, right? <laughs> you really, you remember yeah. almost every moment. Of I it. mean, I can't think of any other time besides that night that I've ever been sober at a Vanderpump yeah. restaurant. I wasn't that drunk either. <laughs> I think, I, you know, I drank as yeah. actively as I could that night, but I remember almost every detail very clearly as yeah. well. And last night I, I was kind of being silly, but I didn't actually get drunk last night, even off three margaritas. I was kind Well, of, you were there like a while. Yeah. It was like a four hour event. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it was, I mean, I don't know if you want to talk about yeah, it Yeah. How was it? It was good. <laughs> It was a good premiere. I mean, I was, I think... G-O-O-D. <laughs> you could call it a certified good from me. Um, no, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was very good. I think I had, you know, very high expectations, obviously. I was like... For the episode or for the party? For, I guess, the premiere. Uh-huh. The episode, I think it, it it met my expectations. I was happy with the episode. The premiere, I was... You know, the premiere was great. I just like... I don't know. I've never been to a premiere before. And mm-hmm. so I, it was... Um, it was was can i just tell the public that uh i could not get my way in and if i wanted to pay my way in all regular human beings it was two hundred dollars yeah i think i'm couching my take because i don't want amy to be so sad at um (laughs) the and at how much of a marvelous occasion it was but in order for turtle time to get there it would have been like yeah a general (laughs) admission situation anyway it's complicated well, I was at home watching the six-part Gypsy Rose uh, doc from her mouth. Six-part? Yeah. <laughs> how many, um, how long are each episode? It was weird. They It kept changing. Like, some were 40 minutes, one was 20 minutes, some were an hour, and then the last one was like an hour 20. Was it on Lifetime? Yeah. 
Whoa. So they didn't adhere to any strict <laughs> format in terms of runtime. No. Yeah, I watched like three or four on Tuesday night and then two last night. Well, before we get to what <laughs> Vanderpump Rules was like, what were there any revelations <laughs> from Gypsy Rose Blanchard's uh, um, documentary or series? Mainly that I wish she wasn't engaged. Why? Um, I just need her to take some time for herself. But they did make a good point that even if they wanted to live together, they couldn't because when you're on parole, you can only live with family. So you have to get married to make oh. him family. Oh, so and she didn't really have much family. Well, left, her right? dad and her stepmom are seemingly good people. Okay. And uh, she has a half sister too um, that she could and was planning on staying with that are like, you know, happy to have her back and seem like good, normal people. Um, but yeah, I'm like, I'm Gypsy Rose pilled now. Like, rooting for her completely. Really? Yeah. Even despite some of the things that some consider <laughs> society, like socially unacceptable, you still stand. Yeah. Really? Uh, no, it's just like she went through hell. Right. I mean, within her, within her house. Yeah. Things that, yeah, horrible, horrible things. Okay. Yeah. Did, is the thing about the, the husband, because I don't know much. I saw that show. You know, I, I passively watched that show with Patricia Arquette. Yeah. Um, so I don't know any of the details. He was a fan who was sending her mail in, uh, um, amidst a lot of fans, right? Right. So she had already had, I think she said a fiance, um, like a ser- if not a fiance, a serious boyfriend in prison um, that like ghosted her. And she was heartbroken by that. And then this new guy reached out. He said that his buddy, they were watching Tiger King during COVID. His uh, friend was like... Is there anything that Tiger King is not responsible <laughs> no. for? I think Tiger King is responsible for COVID. It's like permeated is the, culture. <laughs> is the ti- Has anybody done the timing? Tiger King started COVID, probably, I think. Probably. It's probably one of the tigers brought it in from wherever it was from. I think so, too. So he um, was watching Tiger King. And his friend was like, I want to write to uh, Joe Exotic. Right. And the guy was like, cool, you write to Joe Exotic and I'll write to Gypsy Rose. Because that show was also, I think, on at the same time, right? I guess so, yeah. So they both did prison letters, and then they got into it and, like, fell in love, I guess. Have you ever written a prison letter? No. We we wrote, well, you and I wrote one to Jen Shaw, <laughs> oh, right. I don't know if you remember. And then I wrote one to Gucci Mane one time. <laughs> he never wrote back. Uh-huh. He was in prison. Do you think he read it? I don't think so. It, oh, I don't know. I, I he, he might have. All I said was, like, you know, I have... Uh, these are songs I love. I hope you get out soon. I love you very much. It wasn't very, it wasn't a very good letter. It doesn't, yeah. but, um, so, okay. It is kind of crazy that just anyone can write, like, I guess it's just public, you know, you can find them if you know where yeah. they're residing yeah. and anyone can write. And I'm like, I hope she didn't get too many nasty letters. No, I mean, <laughs> I think, um, I think what's it called? Prison people. Who are the people who are run the prison wardens? Uh-huh. I think wardens read the letter first and they put a big red X if it's mean and a big <laughs> green thumbs up if it's good. Yeah. The new fiance was saying that they were talking about how they wanted to um, get married like secretly. And he said that the guard walked by and was like, y'all can't do that without your friends and family. And they Aww. were like, okay. <laughs> That's sweet. Um, and then the, and then the, the guard let out all the prisoners so that they could be in the yeah, room with them. Yeah, it was like Paddington them. too. Wait, you haven't seen it, but there's a prison uh, dance scene. Really? <laughs> yeah. Nuh-uh. It's really Why cute. is Paddington in jail? Incarcerated. Uh, why is he in jail? I don't remember. I'm going to watch those movies for sure. You should. Uh, um, but my favorite uh, thing that I have already forgotten what I was going to say uh, favorite thing about the Gypsy Rose documentary? <laughs> oh, just an interesting revelation that I had forgotten was that when they killed her mom, they ran away, you know, and like took the Greyhound somewhere. But everyone in the world thought that she was in a wheelchair and stuff. Right. And so when the wheelchair was left, they were like, she's kidnapped because how is she getting anywhere without that wheelchair? Who thought that? All the everyone. cops and everything? It was like on the news. Like everyone was like, they must have just thrown her over her shoulder and ran. And everybody knew her previously because she would be showing up to all these like competitions at, or like not competitions, but like things. <laughs> yeah, like Make-A-Wish, um, like Habitat for Humanity. Like they used, the mom was like so on top of getting freebies every yeah. chance she got. Wow. Yeah. Um, so. so yeah, like we yeah, so like we talked about. I mean, 
she, that mom definitely got what's coming to her, right? <laughs> she had it coming. <laughs> um, so then, no, I mean, it, it was horrible. She, like, the way it went down is, like, so gruesome and fucked up. I had, like, a nightmare about it. Is it, was, it was stabbing? Yeah. Oh, that's the worst way. It was like a hunting knife. Sorry, oh, guys. Grizzly. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> We're talking about murder. It's horrible. but th- And that is one of the worst, like, ho- horrible ways that someone could do it. It's, like, so... Like, uh, I... um. I was watching the OJ documentary, you know, like yeah. six months ago or whatever. It's like, that's the one that's like passionate rage. Like only yeah. the, the like most fucked up people are able to do that when they're yeah. killing someone. Yeah, totally. What? Oh. So that boyfriend, the her, I mean, bad track record for dating so far, <laughs> two out of the three, yeah. one goes to her in prison. <laughs> and then the other one is, is he still in jail? Yeah. I think lifer. Yeah. Cause he, he was more culpable. Completely. He fi- like physically did it, even though she technically asked him to. There's a video. She took a cell phone video of giving him a tour of the house, like so that he would know what to do when he got there. And it's honestly, it's fucked up, but it's like very funny. It's just a like first person video, like of facing outward to the house. You see her hand. It's hard to describe on a podcast, but you just see her hand pointing at her mom's bed, hand pointing. And then her hand making the stabbing no. motion. <laughs> She's like, there and stab. this. Stab. That person there, stab, Whoa. stab, stab. The only two symbols you <laughs> really need to get across what you're and trying like, to say. And I'm like, did you have to t- <laughs> make so, it so clear? And that's in the documentary? Yeah. And like prosecution got that video and her team didn't know about it. And they were like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> Point. And that's who you stab. And had she ever met the boyfriend who decided to do this? Um, he had, uh, come and met her at the movies oh, when right. she was going to see Kenneth Branagh's Cinderella in 2015. Kenneth Branagh made a Cinderella adaptation? Yeah, the Lily James one. Oh, wow. I don't remember. I know <laughs> yeah, Lily I James from Mamma Mia 2. Yeah. That was the first thing I'd ever seen, seen her in. And then I didn't know he did a Cinderella. That mm-hmm. must have flopped hard culturally and I think it did. in the box office. Yeah. Um, yeah, like real human Cinderella. Uh, was it good? Did you ever see it? Never saw it. I haven't seen any of the Disney remakes. I can't do it. Oh, I'm sorry. That was a lie. I was thinking he went he went rogue and did his own <laughs> adaptation of no, the action, classic yeah. story. It was the live action yeah. Disney. Wow. Mm-hmm. Kenneth Branagh makes a lot of shit. I know. For such a Shakespearean actor, <laughs> Hamlet guy, he's like, he makes dog shit movies. He probably makes a ton of money. Well, okay. Yeah, if he wants to. If <laughs> Get <he's>, that coin. <laughs> yeah, okay. If he's in it for the money. Okay, but all this to say, you said a point about Gypsy Rose. You said, I don't like this new husband. I think that I mean, it he seems too- fine. I'm just like, she's never been free. Like, can she just like chill and like not? That's how I feel about Ariana. I'm like, you've never been free. I, I was really thinking of that comparison. I was like, am I going to go out on a limb and say this comparison that's horrific that Ariana and Daniel, but I mean, it's, I, I know what you mean. Yeah. I'm just like, you've never been free in your whole entire life. She yeah. was in prison with her mom, then went to prison for eight years. She ha- has no idea how to live in the world. And I'm yeah. a little concerned about her being like under the wing of this random man who sought her out. So did he, is he, he's in the documentary, right? Mm-hmm. Did you get a, were you able to get a whiff of his <laughs> humanity through his interviews? Yeah. I can tell he doesn't was... seem terrible. Like okay. I, he, I wasn't like freaked out by him. I'm just like, like her stepmom was like, please don't get married. Please just like date first. Yes. Like, can you just like date for like a year? But then she couldn't live with him and she'd have to live with her family mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Um, did the other friend get in touch with Joe Exotic? <laughs> That's a good question. They we should write talk- to the fiance and ask him or husband. They got married. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you said, okay, so you're, you're on board. Um, <laughs> except when she's on dancing with the stars i will vote for her okay cool all right well i'm gonna watch it too just because of how much we've talked about gypsy rose but i will say culturally i do think she fell off a little bit in the last couple <laughs> weeks i think if you were looking at google trends yeah and you'd saw on january 3rd or whatever it was was it just after the new year when we were all so. when we were gypsy pilled um that was probably a <laughs> yeah, high high she got out december 28th oh okay yeah so yeah that kind of took over our like our christmas and our new years <laughs> and then now it's not as big but i do want to watch the definitive documentary i want to yeah, know the facts you should um it flies by because is it biased towards her <laughs> um I or mean, it lets you make your own decision yeah i mean she was a true uh victim up till a certain 
point and then it's like of course imagine if you hadn't you were never allowed to do anything in your whole life and then you got like a myspace account or like a facebook yeah. account how like wild you would go oh yeah i went wild <laughs> i was just like that when i was 18 years old or 17 when myspace came out i went nuts on it yeah i was trying to show my full personality as a burgeoning adult yeah i we can were, only yeah. imagine we were saying how the whole thing is very like todd Solons, like She's You're like right. wearing like a princess out. She's like 20 years old and she, her way Welcome of dressing up is, to, yeah, she's like wearing like a like princess wig and a princess dress because she has no other fancy clothes. Oh man. It's like very bleak. Yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I'm going to stay tuned and I'm going to watch that uh, documentary series. Please do. And um, yeah. And then just sort of in the same realm, <laughs> the Vanderpump Rules season 11 <laughs> premiere uh, I think that was my favorite part of the actual premiere was getting to watch it. Yeah. Um, because, well, are you allowed to say anything? I, I can't say any of the specifics, like the dramatic moments that happen, but I can talk generally about it. Mm -hmm. Um, I will say a lot of people found it to be sad and emotional, okay. which you can imagine that why sense. that would be the case. Um, I talked to Sheena afterwards and she said that she cried twice during it. And that they had only just seen it the night before. So they were watching it for oh, the wow. second time live. And they haven't seen any of the rest of the season. Oh, so wow. they have no idea how the season's going to come out. Sheena said specifically, she was like, I thought that episode was great, but I don't know at all what the season is going to be like. Whoa. They're just, you know, they were just in the moment and they just, they don't know what the trajectory of the season is going to be, what the storylines are going to be and how they're going to tease them out. So yeah. that was interesting to me. Do you think, did you see that, um, I saw it on TikTok, but her and Brock on her podcast we're talking about like his Australian kids and um how he doesn't see them or like isn't allowed to see them or all that I wonder if that's going to be covered and they were trying to get ahead of it or something oh. because I was like why are they bringing this up it feels like a bad idea to bring it up well I think the reason why they brought it up is because they were in uh New Zealand okay. like he's he's a he's a New Zealandite New Zealander okay. and I think they were in Australia and I think too many people brought up the fact that if you're that close which right. I, don't, I don't know geography so I don't know how <laughs> close they are but they were like if you're going to be that close did did you see yeah. your kids while you were, you know, in that region okay. or whatever? And so I think that's maybe why it was okay. brought up. But I'm sure, I mean, if they, I mean, that would be a uh, valuable storyline to bring sure. up. I mean, it's a huge deal in Brock's life. What did you get? Did you, he I didn't listen to that. Yeah. Did you hear why, they, what, what's going on and why? Um, I think that it's just still like a sensitive situation. And like they have a stepdad now that is basically their dad. And I think he's kind of like not necessarily welcome yet or something like and he's like all I can do is just keep you know being available and making my um payments because <laughs> um, oh. you know he was delinquent for a while yeah. um and he was like we're all settled up there and whatever and he was upset but the comments were not good like I'm like oh maybe the honeymoon phase is over for him Oh, was that on, um, was that on shenanigans, like on their official? I think it was, Sh was it Sheena's TikTok, the clip? Oh, okay. Something like that. But like, yeah, people were getting kind of feisty on there. Well, because we all had, like, initially the impression of Brock was bad. Yeah. And then we sort of rebounded when Lala, uh, reclaimed him in our right. eyes. And then now I think if, if you remember the details that we all sort of forget, it's like, oh, damn, I mean... <laughs> More people are will probably are going to be upset the more they learn and remember, you know, the past. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I always am saying, I'm like, did we just, we're just going to move past that? I mean, I, sure. I think, <laughs> I think uh, if I were them, I would make it a part of their story in a real way. So it doesn't look like you're trying to sweep things under the rug to present a picture that's not accurate. Yeah. And so like, I think if Brock openly wanted to talk about that, I know it's very hard. But what's more real than that? Yeah. The fact that he cannot see his, what is it, two children or just I one? I think so. One of them, isn't one of them named like Winter Moon or something? Right, right. One is, well, <laughs> like I think Winter one is, Sun. <laughs> I think one is Winter Sun. No, no, you're right. No, it's Winter and then, and then they have Summer Moon. But yeah. I don't know. I'm just, I'm not trying to, I'm not like, you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty pro Sheena, yeah. obviously. But I think that making those huge real things even though they're inconvenient and horrible to talk about would be beneficial to them because sheena has a um there's a perception of her that she wants to present a sort of fanciful reality sometimes mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to get into the weeds of like 
dark shit that's happening, which yeah. most of us do. But if yeah. you're on Vanderpump Rules, I mean, that would be something to explore. Could you yeah. imagine how powerful that would be if Brock was actively yeah. talking about that and trying to get back in their lives? Yeah, for sure. I think it's also tricky because, you know, when it's like a legal situation or there's other people that aren't on the show involved, I think it's like hard to talk about because it's kind of like, should I be talking about this publicly? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, it's like, am I inviting, am I, did I do something bad? And am I just inviting more scrutiny into a bad thing that I did? Yeah. Or like putting their business on camera, you know? But then you'd make the case. It's like, you know, look what, you know, Ariana put on camera, look what, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. But yeah, I mean like, does his ex want him talking about it on camera? You know? Well, yeah. I mean, there, but there's a way to talk about something like I'm like Whitney on Salt Lake City. Like she talks about her dad and we know that that dad does not want to be associated with the show anymore, but she still can openly bring it up whenever there's an opportunity to, to just say things are bad yeah. and we're actively. Well, she doesn't worry about uh, offending him because they don't talk anymore. <laughs> but if you're trying to win someone back, oh, do oh. you want to like talk about your business? Oh, right. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a way. There's a. I think there's a way where you could do that tastefully. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, if you, <laughs> I, in my opinion, I think that there is nothing, like, if you did something horrible in your past, and I'm not even saying Brock did, but I mean, I, there is people who absolutely hate the decisions he's made. There was I, a restraining order. <laughs> yeah. Right. I guess. Right. Right. Yeah. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe you're. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I mean, it's just... up to the person. But like, it's like a lot of times when people are getting divorced. Like, they're like, I can't talk about it. Or, you know, if there's a custody battle, they're like, I can't talk about it because of legal reasons or because, like, you don't want to bring the kids into it. But, you know, I don't know what her deal is. But, um, yeah, so you you saw them last night. Yeah. Did you get to mingle with anyone else? Um, So some people came up to uh, me, which is very nice. There were some little turtle cuties there. Nice. Specifically, I think someone was like Ariana's very good friend came up and congratulated Turtle Time, us, for they were a listener and they love Turtle Time. And they said that they pass around Turtle Time clips. Like she (gasps) passes around Turtle Time clips to Ariana sometimes and they Uh, laugh at some of the wonderful things we say. So I thought that was really sweet. You also had a celebrity fan. Uh, (laughs) Yes. Do what? Should I say that? Why not? Well, I don't know. I don't like to. I don't. I don't like to brag you know but well it was public that she was there so oh, it was yeah how did you how do you know i think uh bravo posted a photo of her with oh. ken and lisa well i had a one like a surreal almost too surreal moment of my life where someone came up to me two people and they were so sweet to me and i you know i was looking at them but i don't look people in the eyes when i'm first meeting and like really stare <laughs> at their faces but they said that they love you know um my tiktok and they had a fun time or whatever and then um uh she said, my name is Dakota. And then the minute I heard Dakota, I go, oh my God, that's Dakota Fanning. I didn't say that out loud. But then, um, I, you know, I was just trying to be normal and nice because she was coming over to say, I said, thank you so much for saying that. That means the world to me. I love that so much. And then when we left, uh, me and my wife just, or when Dakota left, I was like, oh my God, that was Dakota Fanning. And it was, yeah, I mean, shocking. She, she's a huge Bravo fan. Yeah. Like huge. Yeah, she's like a good Watch What Happens guest. Oh, I never, I didn't know she was on Watch What Happens Live. Yeah. And I know, I think, uh I think they're also i think l fanning was at when i was watching paris and love she was at paris hilton's event so i think they're all very like in that's, the mix on so, these things that's so awesome when Which, i find out yeah. like that some huge celebrity is like a bravo fan it's like such a uniting thing it's yeah like, did you see that jessica chastain uh she met uh i think it was the was that the emmys yeah the emmys she met garcelle and she was like freaking out that's awesome she was like oh my god she was like you're such a great addition to the show i love you can i give you a hug that is so fun <laughs> she's like an oscar winning i love how like, like fame is relative you know oh, yeah. it's like it's like if gypsy rose was out on the street at trader <laughs> joe's like maybe uh taylor swift would be like I'm, god willing i like if taylor Swift's shopping at trader joe's alone or whatever and she sees gypsy rose she'd be like i'm a huge fan of you there's no there's no fame you know well that's the famous? best part about bravo specifically yes. is that uh, who was saying, wasn't it at like upfronts or something like that, where, um, all of the stars, like no one gave a shit about the TV or like movie stars that were on the carpet, but they all were 
freaking out about the Bravo people that were there. Who, where was that at? I think it was like NBC Upfront or oh, something. Okay. And there were like real celebrities yeah. there. And everyone was like, get out of my way. Yeah. Like Lisa Vanderpump is here. Get out of my way, <laughs> Jeremy Allen White. Is that that guy's name? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I say, yeah. So it was, it's, yeah, it, it was fun. I love, I just love that, like at BravoCon, Bravo brings pe- people together so actively. So like so actively creates fans because of the quality mm-hmm. and the things that happen in the Bravo network that it's like this, yeah, unifying thing. And that and I got a little bit of that at the premiere. It was yeah. so fun and nice. Um yeah, and then in in terms of the episode, like there are little things I probably can say. Like um James's mom came up to me. Oh, All of a sudden wow. she looked at me <sighs> and then I had this sign of recognition. And then she came up to me and she said, um you're the man that does those little TikToks about my son. And I said, yes. Yeah, I've made TikToks about your son, James. And she goes, oh, I really like those so much. And then I <laughs> said, well, how did you like the premiere? And she said, oh, I love it. I love everything my son does. And I said, that's great. And she goes, but he's got uh, some hard stuff coming to him later in the season. And I go, oh, God. And she goes, oh, no, no, no. It's not that horrible, but there is some emotional stuff coming up. The dog? Um, I think. I think so. Yeah. I don't know. I, th- I mean, she was just, te- she didn't tell me specifically what it was, yeah. but so that's another tease for like the season arc. Cause I, I yeah, I guess it, uh, maybe it's the dog. I don't know. I, I don't know what horrible potentially could have happened in James's life that, but was the London gangsta there? He wasn't there. He, he wasn't <laughs> that there. That would have been major. Oh, if I saw the You'd London gangsta. You'd have to get gangster, a pick. Oh. That that would have been the only pick I sought actively. I would have said, "Can I please?" St- What's his name? Davo, da- not Davos. Yeah, it's something Greek. Yeah, um, uh, I would have loved to take a photo with him. Um, yeah, that was sweet. And then I think that's. I mean, I think that's it. I will say as a tease. So the premiere was very good, mm-hmm. great. There is one decision that a cast member makes that I think will need to be scrutinized by you and I very diligently when the premiere comes out. And I'm going to say who the cast member that makes that decision as a tease, Lala makes a mm. very, some would say bold, some would say strategic, some would say horrible. <laughs> she makes a decision in the, so this is a tease. I mean, I'm not, I'm not giving anything away, but Lala definitely chooses, stakes a claim in something. And it's, you know, and I think that is going to provide a lot of fuel for the, the season. I can't opinion. wait. Yeah. Can they get me a freaking screener? They let all everyone in LA go watch it in public. Can they just let me go watch it? Well, apparently, <laughs> apparently the bra- the NBC Universal screener list is so jam packed. So jam packed with who I don't know who write who like it's the Ringer, Daily Beast. Who writes these recaps? Vulture. I understand why. Can one of those writers invite me over? <laughs> yeah, I want, I get why Brian Moylan gets screeners for Vulture or whatever. But come on, open the floodgates for yeah. a scrappy up and coming podcast called turtle time <laughs> we will do so much magic with those screeners yeah. no one will have a chance uh, like to make better commentary if we have access to them earlier Seriously? we don't have to do the southern charm challenge anymore <laughs> i know i know <laughs> we will I well, mean, don't, we, we made will. the best of it we, we did um so it, yeah. did i accurately entice you for vanderpump rules did you feel like the first episode was sort of like a tee up or was it like its own? So I won't get thing. into the spe- uh, specifics, but there is a uh, there is something that you feel it's loss and lack, and then the way they end the first episode, it's like um, you never watched the Mandalorian, but it's like Baby Yoda being introduced <laughs> in the Mandalorian, where it's like okay. I get what why things seemed a little off, uh-huh. and now the entire season is is going to be reconciled. Okay. Like, I, yeah, it's it's they they were you it. like I would like to see the baby. I was exactly <laughs> like that. I mean, and they even I, people will like this when it's the thirtieth of January and you get to watch it. It's almost sh- sort of set up just like Baby Yoda's reveal in Mandalorian. <laughs> so, mark my words, wow. that's exactly how they present it. And I was only being. Um, non-committal about the premiere's impact because i wanted you to preface that you had fun at home watching gypsy rose yeah. and now that that's out of the way and i'm not making you feel bad the premiere was excellent and fun and i got to drink all i could drink great. and everybody was dancing and having a great time and i thank bravo for letting me be there but next time bravo for the love of god let turtle time go there please <laughs> if you want to go yeah um so they also showed the valley um, trailer yeah. right so yeah let me set the scene for this and i can be i can talk all every minute of the valley <laughs> um so the lights went down 
Lisa goes, shut up, everyone, shut up. A new show is coming out. Shut up right now. And then the lights went down, and then all of a sudden you hear the roar of a little uh, vehicle that you don't know what the vehicle was. And then Jax's face appeared on all of the screens. And I watched the Vanderpump Rules cast members as they reacted to the trailer. And I'll just say, I looked at James specifically because he was right in my eyeline. And James gave absolutely no reaction to this trailer being premiered. And uh, it was... um, Every it was the best place, obviously, for that trailer, and I think people were so amped up for Vanderpump Rules in general that obviously we'll take seeing Jax and especially Kristen. People mm-hmm. were stoked to see Kristen. Uh-huh. Like I was more stoked. But um, I mean, do you want to talk about the trailer specifically? Yeah. Because that was the best audience that they could show it to. But I feel like that's not the global view of this trailer. My response was, "What is this?" Yeah. So so um. <laughs> It's, First it's, of all, uh, my friend Jen said, why is Jax wearing OJ gloves in the yeah. <laughs> driving his little beep beep car? Yeah, I don't like to look at Twitter to get like takes from there or steal anything from there. But I saw one uh, tweet that said, why are they setting up Jax like he's about to murder everybody on his street wearing <laughs> gloves and looking directly in the camera with a sort of maniacal look? Yeah, he looks terrifying. I don't really understand the concept of the trailer. Well, well no one would. <laughs> It's, like, what did the agency that p- pitched that or whoever did it at Bravo, like, what was the pitch? So, like, glamour in the valley? So uh, so there is a new there is a new thing, like, for movies, huge movies, where you get a teaser trailer yeah. and it has nothing to do with the concept. So this was that. Like, this, this can't be considered a trailer because it shows nothing from no. the show. And we have no sense of this show. And also because um, there's no... Uh, clues to what the format is we're just completely confused by what the hell this is yeah um no it's like yeah Jax is in a little power wheel um he's driving through there's like two new couples that we don't have never met before yeah and, and 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 I think that um that does a disservice that they didn't announce who these people were and actually Give them a speech to say or right. something to say, like like a like a Bravo trailer for a new series. Like if when Roni was premiering, they didn't just like, I don't know, they they had like quotables coming out from yeah. So yeah. it's like Danny and Mia, Jason and Jesse, and you're like, I don't know, <laughs> are, are these real friends? I don't know these? them from Adam. I don't know them from Adam <laughs> at all. Are they? People that are real friends in their neighborhood that they cast because this is a good camaraderie. Are they people from re- other reality shows that are now going on this show because they happen to live right. close to Jax and Brittany? So out of context, you, you're like, why are Jax and Brittany and Kristen on a show with five <laughs> other people that we don't know anything about and we've never heard about? Right. It's you on you set them up for failure because everyone is going to have the exact same reaction that we're having now. Who are they yeah. on a show with? Yeah, uh, all the comments were like, who asked for this? Bring back Stassi and Bo. This sucks. Well, (laughs) also they did a a disservice by not announcing, like if they would have just done a full cast reveal and had this trailer have sound bites from everyone, people would have been acclimated to the fact that Stassi and Bo were not in it. Now they have a teaser trailer that people thought that the Valley spinoff would possibly include them. So now it's like not only confusing, but it's disappointing too. It's just... You made a very mysterious tease for a show that needs a lot of explanation for <laughs> hardcore Bravo yeah, it's fans. Like Kristen taking out the trash in a sequin dress. And I'm like, okay, so is the like yeah, there's just no context of like we used to party and now we live in the valley. Like, cause Kristen still doesn't have kids. She's not married, so it's like what's the concept? I, I, yeah, I mean, I have, I, I have a lot of thoughts and questions about this. Like, first of all, it has no ties, even from a brand, uh, in a brand sense to Vanderpump rules by that name. The name is extremely generic. No offense, Bravo, but the Valley, (laughs) I mean, I don't even know why, I mean, Valley rules, even though that's like the easiest title you could give it, that makes so much more sense. At least connected to the universe that this is a spinoff from. So the Valley just, I don't know, I mean... That's also a confusing title because it's just so generic that you don't know what this is. Yeah. And it's like, what does the valley mean to you? Like, what are you saying by that? Yeah. And then this being um, a scripted teaser, you're like, is like, is this a reality show as well? Like, is it going to be in the same style as, right. as Vanderpump Rules? Um, I also just like, 
I just, I'm so removed from when Jax and Brittany were fired and when Kristen were fired, we're like so far removed, um, as a, as a fan base from what led to that. So now they all get the spotlight again, but it's like, why couldn't they go on Vanderpump Rules again? Right. You get, they, they are back in the zeitgeist. They're back on Bravo in every way. They're cherished by Bravo. They, they were reclaimed, but they don't go back on the show that they would be very, uh, it would be a very powerful addition to bring them back. Someone said, I think a, a reliable source said that Jax Taylor specifically burned a bridge so bright with a producer on Vanderpump Rules that he can never go back. Wow. Specifically, it could be Lisa or it could be, you know, Alex Baskin. Yeah. And so that is now the only thing rationale that makes sense to me why if they're reclaiming those three cast members why they can't just go back to Vanderpump Rules right it be because s- it makes total sense for if Jax was back in the mix he would just do exactly what we, he always did where he because it seems like he's cool with the Toms again despite all the shit he talked like there's a photo of the three of them framed at Jax's studio city Jax is it's it, that is um exactly Jax's um <laughs> mo every time he can say the worst shit about anybody drag them through the mud call lisa a cardboard cutout or whatever and then go to them in three days and say i'm ready to forgive you now i don't know what the hell i said what did i say about you you right. know what i mean and which would just... have been hilarious to watch because he would have just gotten in the mix on everything fucked over sandoval probably like 400 times and you'd also get the valley concept Mm -hmm. by just including them still in Vanderpump Rules he would still like he's just like you were gonna say like he still is gonna go home and do the shit he's gonna say he's gonna talk shit about Lisa and then he's gonna drive home and then you could have his his home life stuff right and then they also have such a bad track record of casting new people in the Vanderpump Rules world so like having these five new people most people are going to think that they're probably not up to the caliber of the Vanderpump Rules cast so no way I just I don't see the rationale for this except for the fact that just Jax and Brittany specifically and maybe Kristen cannot go back in a full-time way to Vanderpump Rules because of some egregious right. thing that happened this is gonna be on Peacock right I, <laughs> I think, <laughs> judging by what I saw I think it looks like it's, sub Peacock it screams Peacock uh, t- it's, it's not too giving like t- yeah I was gonna say like uh what was that short-lived short short swim oh oh um, uh, oh oh quibby, quibby. It's quibby. it was giving quibby quibby classic <laughs> um no i don't want to talk too much shit because really i don't know and if i was betting my chips on something like when ugt was announced like i mm-hmm. liked ugt season two like you would think ugt would be pure shit if yeah. you were just betting on sure. it but, but that's the- like that is such like it's basically just like overflow content where they're like it's the easiest thing in the world. Let's just like gather up our yes. existing talent, send them off. It's for one week. It costs us very little. Mm-hmm. People will watch it. Like it's like something you watch while you're like painting your nails or like yeah. vacuuming. Like it's like the most like whatever. Like I'm happy to have it, but it's not like feeding me. Right. This I'm like, it doesn't even look like watchable. Well, we'll again, I don't know. We'll see. So they, they, I think, yeah, I mean, I just, I have to stick with, they did a disservice to this cast and to Jackson Brittany by not giving us anything about what this is going to be. Obviously, a two minute real trailer with, with scenes from this would give us so much more context. And now we can only be critical of this very weird decision that has these um, canceled cast members, formerly canceled, now reclaimed on a show called The Valley. (laughs) That with no context, you would like, what would a non Bravo fan think of that teaser uh, and, right. and the kind of shit that we're watching over here? Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know. I was thinking that. I'm like, we have all the context in the world and it still yes. doesn't make any sense. If you had none, you'd be like, what is that? Hey, my friend, non Bravo fan, can you watch this trailer and let me know <laughs> if you think this show looks good? <laughs> yeah. There's like no, uh, yeah, definition. Um, I, Speaking of people that should have returned to the show, I know that we both listened to Rachel Goes Rogue episode two. You're good at segues. I never um, complimented <laughs> you. You're complimenting you about that. You're very good at getting us to, back to what we need to talk about. That was a great segue. Um, Rachel um, Goes Rogue is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, right? I saw on TikTok that you had watched it and I was like, oh shit, I got to watch or listen. Um, so did I, I entice you to or did you just know that you had to? Yes, I didn't. I. 
I've told you this before. I would love to watch your videos. I generally don't though, because I don't want to spoil your takes yeah. for our conversation. Yeah. Save them fresh and hot. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to regurgitate, but, um, cause I had listened to the first one. I was, uh, I was listening to a different podcast that talked about her first episode and they said the same thing, mentioned the same thing that we talked about where the producer, was like not on a professional microphone and kept chiming in. Yeah. And they were saying, I don't know if we said the same thing, but it was basically like they were like, it seemed like they didn't expect for it to be left in. Yeah. Like they thought that it was going to be more prompts, but then it turned out that she, it would make absolutely no sense if they didn't leave the audio in. So it could have been something like recite the, the my question in the answer yes and rachel didn't do that so it could have been a monologue that made sense right um, because the microphone was improved well, this. but then they didn't explain who they are no so that's still a flop but like at least it wasn't like rachel tell us uh what the first time you and tom hooked up like please <laughs> <laughs> Here's how you do. Rachel goes rogue episode three. Hi, my name is Danielle. I'm a producer at iHeartRadio, and I'm here to help Rachel tell her story. My name is Danielle. You know, yeah. whatever. Like, yeah. Just like, just introduce who is asking questions. Because right now it could be Emperor Palpatine, like you said, just trying to get the um, get answers from Rachel for their own benefit. Right. But, but, yeah. but all that to say, I, the format still needs work. I don't know what the hell is going on. The format needs work, and you have to introduce the people who are speaking. What if we had turtle time and we never introduced who the hell we were, or we had someone speaking, and you're just like, "Did they get a new person?" To yeah, talk? someone's on the side that's like, "Talk about the premiere." <laughs> we, we used to do that. We should have a third voice that that does our segues like, for us. Gypsy Rose. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you watch Gypsy Rose, Amy? It's like, whoa, yeah, that's our producer, by the way, and they never see him on YouTube. Um, so, so formatting wise, this leaves a lot to be desired. I would say that right to Rachel. I'm, I'm not. I don't yeah. feel like I'm. I would say that to iHeart. I would yeah. say, guys, please. I, I understand what you're trying to do, and you're getting to the format, but establish who you are when you're asking questions. But I will say though, I think episode two made episode one. Episode one. People could take it or leave it. It was mostly filler or things they'd already heard about. Episode two made the case for going rogue, in my mm -hmm. opinion. It was almost, yeah. it was, Like BTS. This was more, still, still, I will not negate your claim that all of this could have actually been handled, except the fourth wall breaking stuff. Yeah. A lot of this could have been addressed if Rachel handled herself strategically on season 11. I, I think that yeah. she still could have potentially had more of a chance than in this uh this form which we talked about last week but the thing she said in this episode makes the case for her actually going rogue and this is now officially rachel just took the match burned the bravo bridge and said never again it shall never be cast again and yeah. anything this was this was the end for me i thought did you i mean maybe i i didn't think it was that bad i mean she she specifically outed how much producer impact there is on bravo and sure. for me i didn't was... find it to be like it was a little bit like oh you know we're getting into it but i think i still think she thought it was worse than i thought it sounded like so basically at one point they're like she had gone on a real date with Peter that didn't go well. And yeah. she was like done with that. And then the producers were like, fuck, like we want a on camera version of that. Can you please go out with him again? And she was like, I don't want to. And she made it sound like horrific. And I was like, I mean, th that's your job. I, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think she came, it came across as she thought that was horrific. I think it just came across as I had a horrible date with Peter. We have no chemistry. I cried and barfed and then he <laughs> wanted to go on a date with me again. I don't like Peter. And then now I have to go on a day date with Peter reminiscent of his date with Vale yes. in the day to be like, I am not on board with this and I don't <laughs> want this to, uh, for me as a viewer, I'm a naive viewer. I think you're more, you're, you uh, no, the the producers' hands are more on this. But for me, it's pretty egregious to find out that I would have rather a flashback or some evidence just saying I went on a date with Peter and it absolutely sucked. Mm -hmm. Like then, her, then then recreating. Yeah, because we hated the Peter and Rachel scenes. We were yeah. like, why are Rachel and Peter dating right now? This sucks. Yeah. She's crying. <laughs> She's obviously not into him. Peter is um 
his his motivation seems so scattered because you don't know if he actually thinks she's into him or not but we know she's not like right. it was a she felt like I, I don't know that to me is a is a peek behind the curtain that i wish that the producers didn't do mm-hmm. I, I wish i i wish that they didn't yeah. force her not force make her think that she had to recreate a date with peter yeah and then string that along for like four episodes. There yeah. was a whole, there was an arc where Rachel had to like break up with him again at Schwartz and Sandy's. And I it's know. like, they weren't even actually dating. She was never interested yeah. in him. I mean, yeah, we're watching the season three right now. And he, like you said, goes on a similar date with Vale. And that whole situation reeks of the exact same scenario. Yeah. of like Vale never wanted to touch Peter with a 10 foot pole. No. And, and um, yeah. And then, and then Rachel said uh, about like, about that situation she was like and then we go into the situation where um i'm going on a date to recreate an experience that i already had that i'm over emotionally and then you're wondering why peter is doing this and she says specifically she's like i don't know if when i'm on this date with peter if he is actually into me and he wants to be on this second date with me knowing that we had this flop first date and i never called him in months after yeah. that or is he just trying to be appear in an episode to get his very high episodic rate because yeah. if he appears in an episode he gets twenty thousand dollars or whatever right so it motivates him to do fake shit <laughs> and so she said and then that that brought to my mind why vanderpump rules is probably so complicated for someone like rachel who is mm-hmm. not as strategic or not as familiar with it, it took the Vanderpump Rules cast a really long time probably to become adept at manipulating storylines in an organic way mm-hmm. to get what they wanted across when Rachel is going into this situation not being a full-time cast member the world to her in this universe has such scattered motivations that she just doesn't know what's real so right. it kind of lends me it lends <laughs> more validity to her saying um I, I don't know in any scene, I don't know if anyone is accurately <laughs> portraying what they're really feeling in any scene. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that that kind of, that nuance to me was interesting to learn, but I think that it, because it sort of um, breaks the fourth wall so much, I don't think Bravo producers will want that to be known for someone like me who was naive mm-hmm. uh, about the, the process. Right. Yeah. I mean, I... I just, it's still just so weird that, do we think truly, how long can, how many episodes can she do that's, because it is going to be in, uh, in alignment with the new season. So she can just comment on the new season, even though she kind of said like, that's not what this is about, but it seems like iHeart set it up exactly that way. All Vanderpump adjacent podcasts start (laughs) start out as them saying that they're going to do something else yeah. and talk about other shit. And then once the numbers come in, when they talk about anything related to Vanderpump Rules, they become dedicated to right. reality TV and Vanderpump Rules. So this is going to become a commentary podcast. But as Rachel comments on the season, her take on everything is going to be less and less important because they are going to find a way to work around Rachel's absence. Yeah. So. And then I don't think ultimately Rachel should, she's doing what Alex McCord and Simon did 20 years ago on Roni when they got fired. They like actively created a like spiteful podcast or whatever, <laughs> just commenting and talking shit about Roni once they weren't on I need it. to find that. I know. It, it was like early <laughs> days. It was like on YouTube or something. Wow. Like they just knew that they were never going to get asked back, even though Alex actually did for UGT right. finally. Will we ever get to see that? <laughs> I don't think so. It's like in court. <laughs> I think, yeah, totally. I think the merit of it, uh, the scandal of it outweighs the merit of it. And Bravo yeah. is like probably not going to release it. Who was on that? So it's Phaedra, okay. Brandy. Uh, was Vicky invited? I think so. Sure. Caroline. Caroline. Brandy. Um, it, it was mostly UGT season two cast with some additions like Caroline Manzo, I think. Okay. Almost the almost the entire season two cast except Jill. Or, you know, I okay. don't know. But now I don't think it will ever come out interesting um but yeah I, it was interesting to hear that it makes sense that of course peter's been on since episode one so he would have a good rate but yeah. he's not I always bet, on i bet it's like i bet i was like underselling it i bet it's like 50 grand an episode yeah because wasn't there there was like an article recently about um uh below deck and how they don't get paid very much like they only make what they would normally make on a charter or something like that and then in the article it was saying that southern charm people make 20k an episode um wait southern charm people yeah make 20k yeah but it must be 
that there must be variation on that, right. you know? Yeah, there, there has to be. Um, there's no one, there's no one in the world, no agent in the world would let their cast members make the same amount of money. No, I think that was just their like example of like what other Bravo celebrities, like non housewives yeah. could make. Yeah. Um, well, well, Sandoval specifically, we learned makes like 1.1 to 1.2 million a season. So whatever the episode rate divided by 20 episodes, that's what he makes. Right. And Peter has been on since the very beginning. He almost started as a full-time cast member on right. season one. So his... He botched it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I actually think Peter has gotten to stay around, you know, longer than sure. I think his his entertainment value has has showed right you know? i just mean like his life would look a lot different if he would have found a way to be a main cast <laughs> i don't think he could. yeah every scene that peter pops his head out and tries to get main character energy ends up making him look worse and makes the audience like ashamed to be watching what they're watching right like when he said dana when dana showed up and he was like dana remember when we made out in the bathroom she goes no we didn't uh, we never did that in our lives what the hell are you talking about and peter was just like oh god <laughs> but yeah i mean if we like put together so if he makes at least let's say he makes 150k for managing sir he makes 20,000 or more here and there throughout the season his like weight watchers deal his like whatever like he cobbles together a pretty decent living oh he cobbles it up and i'm not <laughs> being dismissive of peter i'm just saying that the vanderpump rules has figured out a way to utilize peter at a, in a good capacity every time they show him um and i think peter is probably i mean I, i'm sure he wanted to be a main cast member but i think he's resigned himself to like what he's doing now yeah um what did you think about rachel saying that that fans sort of have some sway potentially and like oh, what right. are active storylines did you think there was any any merit to that i mean i think that's true like, like fan service and yeah a way. i mean they do they do those like um what do they call that when they uh like test groups and stuff um like what do they call that when it's like how people respond to certain characters it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Focus groups. Yeah, they like test, uh, and I think that makes a big impact of like who they bring back. And I mean, but she's talking yeah. more about like storylines, storylines. But um, yeah, I mean, I believe that it makes sense. I'm like, they have to go off of something, right? Yeah. <laughs> what about um the the Schwartz kiss stuff? Did you, oh God. Did you think that was interesting? I was still like kind of confused about that. Well, so she thinks that well, she said which this could be just trying to make herself honorable post you know scandal but whatever i mean i'm just gonna say what she said which is that um after katie talked to her which i remember the talk when katie said if you kiss schwartz i will have trouble being your friend or yeah. i will want to be your friend we all were like katie told you uh, explicitly yeah and um so then rachel told sheena that hey i'm i'm not gonna you know do anything with schwartz i'm gonna respect katie's wishes i want to be friends with her more than i want to kiss schwartz i think she was also she had actively had sex with sandoval at this point uh -huh. so it's like what am i doing pursuing this and then the producer said what the hell are you doing here rachel we have we have a reality show to make <laughs> oh, don't right. don't just um um try to toss off the idea that you might kiss schwartz in the future like trying to string out that possibility yeah. for a storyline. Also, what I thought was interesting, what Rachel said, was that she had a whole Miss California storyline uh, that she wanted to tee up as her big yeah. thing. And then when she didn't place properly, you remember how upset she was yeah. that she didn't like continue on in, in the competition, that she had no storyline left besides just dating. Right. So then she had, um, in desperation, I'm just using that word because I can't think of another word, in desperation <laughs> had to find other storylines that she knew would be impactful yeah and this is her first time as a full-time cast member so the schwartz thing became more and more enticing because she knew it would get her some leverage right yeah i mean i mean watching it at the time we were all like what is she doing <laughs> right i mean it, it makes her motivations that were very um uh misplaced and we didn't understand if you believe her, it, it makes it it known, I guess, that producers might have had a subtle nudging to get her back to the place where she kissed Schwartz. You know, yeah. and, then, and then she said that like it was clearly producer driven because of the way the tables were set up, which I remember when we watched that. Yeah. 
It was like they were sitting at this beautiful table with the <laughs> lights coming down on them with an entire audience right. watching them. You know, and then didn't she say they like went over into the pool unexpectedly and the cameraman had to like get in the pool and they like weren't like ready to do it. Yeah, they wanted a more <laughs> private moment. And then she said that after they kissed, Sandoval Army crawled over to them with two gigantic beers to like um, <laughs> toast them for doing that kiss because he was loving the fact that there is going to be scrutiny on this and not on him actually having sex with right. you know Rachel at some point. Yeah. So um I think my overall my recommendation is that if you want to hear an alternate version of, you know, the season 10 timeline and what was possibly going on with Rachel, even if you fully don't believe her, it might be worth just weighing what she said against what you know just to have a complete picture and um you know, I don't know. I think she fulfilled what she wanted to do with that podcast with that episode but the format and the longevity <laughs> and all that shit is up for debate i don't yeah, know it's if, almost like it should just have been like a four-part thing yeah the minute the minute uh, i was just gonna say that if this would have just been a limited thing where it was four parts my, rachel's story yeah the entire thing and just get it out of the way and then if people like that figure out how to continue yeah. but having just an ongoing potential podcast where the format is not very clear it's just like the valley right you have no clue what this is going to end up being it's like doomed to fail because it's how is it going to be maintained yeah. um but yeah i've been wondering whether or not i should i don't i can't watch all of it but i'm like should i watch like the top five episodes of season 10 before season 11 oh um do I think you should? Yeah. Are uh, you going to watch any? Just to like get back into the spirit? To like remember where we left off? Like well, having watched the first one, do you think that it would have, I mean, obviously we talk about it constantly, so it's, I'm pretty fresh on the details, but sometimes I'm like, ooh, it'd be fun to watch like the first episode of the season to see how the season began. Maybe like the beach one and then yeah, like Tower 12. the last two or something, yeah, yeah. I you think know, the, the run to Scandival would be beneficial to watch. But like I watched the premiere and there was nothing that I needed to be reminded of. It felt like the main uh, tenets of Scandival that we all remember were addressed and there was really nothing like that I needed to be reminded of. Yeah. They did a good job of like just knowing what the collective remembrance is of Scandival and just addressing that. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm more just like, uh, I mostly got intrigued when we were talking about, um, I think this was on the Patreon, but we were reminiscing about the secrets revealed of season 10. I was like, I kind of want to watch that again. Oh yeah. That was great. Like had so many good moments because they feel like so much got dropped in. They really wanted to focus on Rachel's weird ass storyline of her kissing everyone and doing weird shit. Um, and there was other stuff that was potentially more I think, engaging. Yeah, I think ultimately I would watch just to maybe see like more of Rachel's like trajectory given this possibly or just watch it just for fun. But um, I do think that Rachel's sort of, um, I, I want to say like lack of knowledge within this universe <laughs> and her sort of floundering in yeah. this space now sort of makes more sense when you take into account that producers potentially were nudging her in directions that she didn't think were realistic yeah slash she was drunk as hell the entire time and also really hurt by the james breakup yeah and just unable to navigate successfully in a reality television environment with pros the people yeah. who are her cast members are fucking <laughs> pros seasoned seasoned as hell <laughs> like they could start a scene where they're sitting on a couch and the producer says you have to talk about why you haven't talked to sandoval in a long time yeah and they'll know like Speaking of, you know, <laughs> Sheena will have the best way to segue, just like your beautiful yeah. segue to talk about Rachel Goes Rogue. They know how to make a scene seem like it was an authentic thought that they just had, even though they're clearly there to get a point across when they yeah. sit down, you know? Did you see, I also saw this on TikTok, um, uh, Craig was on, what was it? Was it Josh Peck's podcast? Yeah, I, I saw a clip of that. They were on like, I think they were on two podcasts. Is it called... <laughs> No, it's, I, I actually, no, I just saw that they were on podcast. I don't know yeah, which one it was. Craig was talking about, they were asking him about exactly what we're talking about of like how authentic it is or whatever. And he had a pretty like good example where he was like, you know, like when we're all hanging out and it's on camera, we can talk about whatever we want. We could talk about, you know, I forget exactly his example. It was like baseball or like some bullshit. He's like, we can do that, but it's a waste of time because 
we the whole point of us being together on camera is to move the story forward yeah. so we need to talk about what's on the docket because otherwise like what are we here for right which is always like you can tell who the people are that are like i want to get out of here like let's like i feel like tamra is always like so what's with that yeah. Like, and it just comes out of nowhere and you're like, oh, she wants to get everybody going. Well, Tamara's horrible at it. Speaking, <laughs> speaking of the exact opposite of organically bringing up something, Tamara is the worst example of it. But yeah, you're yeah. right. That that makes sense. So I think, I guess, reality television and these Bravo shows, ultimately what they're going through is real and a representation of their real life. Like the fact that Peter and Rachel had to like show off that they had done this before yeah. but the way they get there and the way these scenes are constructed have some artificiality to them right and maybe that's what you take away from rachel's podcast because it didn't it didn't hamper my enjoyment i'm not like stunned by right. anything she said no yeah and it's like that's why they need to focus on getting everyone together as much as possible because then things can happen just by nature of people being in the same room and i was gonna say this is like i've noticed on roni specifically but also southern charm and everywhere i kind of am like i understand why they do it logistically but i'm like we need to put a kibosh on the facetimes yeah, you, yeah. I mean, they are starting to become very, very. On Beverly Hills, prevalent. there was like seven Facetimes. Yeah, I, I was mean, like, it's, this is boring. You're, you're right. I didn't even actually. I didn't even think about it, but it's definitely way easier for production than having Garcelle come over to Sutton's house right. anytime. Like, yeah, they use like there was like thirty Facetimes <laughs> in the recent episode of yeah. Beverly Hills. You're, like, I understand it used to be more like when they're getting ready to go out and they're about to be like like what is going to yeah. happen tonight and like that's okay because it's like right before but now they just use it as all check-ins yeah. you're right i didn't even think about that but it was yeah it was egregious this episode of beverly hills it's like cheap i'm like you guys we're getting pa- you guys are getting paid like yeah. you need to show up yeah that's <laughs> that's something that bravo needs to consider um for sure and um yeah i mean i, I think I mean, oh that's wait it. we didn't talk about rachel freaking shared your tiktok Okay. Yes, she did. So, so I'm, yeah, she did. Rachel, <laughs> uh, reached out to me on Instagram. Uh, she follows me. I follow her. So it was an easy way for her to get in touch with me. She said, I shared your recap of Rachel goes rogue. So first she saw it on my story and she liked it. And I was uh-huh. like, Oh, that's sweet. I, um, I'm not, you know, I feel very objective when I talk about Rachel goes rogue. Mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm alienating the Vanderpump Rules cast that I love more than life itself. I don't feel like I'm being overly critical about Rachel. I'm just saying what she said. Yeah. And I'm not I'm not on anybody's side. And I've also gotten so far past the black and white villain and hero mindset that we had directly after Scandaval. So regardless, I am fine that Rachel thought my recap was good because all I did was just in a snippy snappy way re you know restate what she said so yeah. i was fine with it so she she messaged me and said do you mind if i i post this um you know i you know i just want to make sure i have your approval and i said yeah you know that's great <laughs> and then uh she posted as a reel which i was like whoa whoa, whoa wait so on your feed for all of your followers i don't know how many followers right she like has. she I didn't like lot. add yours to her story she like downloaded it and she reposted downloaded it from it. tiktok because all she saw was from my story so she didn't see it on tiktok she saw it on instagram story she went to tiktok to get the full thing she downloaded it and i guess put the full six minute or seven minute <laughs> recap as a reel i didn't watch the full thing so that's funny i'm like okay you're really <laughs> touting my video like that's like yeah. that's a bridge that's a that's like a um a big step yeah. and then she included in her caption which you saw this she said check out this video by this man named <laughs> riley who called my episode unfettered unencumbered and a masterpiece that you know it was a masterpiece right and it can't and, a, and a, something you absolutely have to listen to or yeah. something right and i was like she gave it the full like movie poster yeah. like an unfettered masterpiece an unfettered masterpiece. i was like okay i'm being used as a blurb which is awesome i mean in the vanderpump rules canon i'm officially a blurb in some cast member you know ex-cast members video but also i did say those things <laughs> <laughs> but out of context i mean like unfiltered could go could mean anything yeah i mean unencumbered unfettered also those words i was just like 
I'm obvious. I'm being hyperbolic in a way. Yeah. Like I'm. I'm not. I'm not dismissing because I did think Rachel goes rogue <laughs> episode two was valuable. I, I. We just talked about how it was valuable. But it's like I don't know. Out of context, I was like imagining if someone's from Vanderpump Rules or you know saw that and they're like, wow, Riley really loved Rachel's <laughs> podcast. Like he was stunned by this masterpiece or whatever. But I'm. I'm. I'm fine with her. Her using it because I think I was responsible with how I covered it, and I didn't uh-huh. say. The producer, this entire thing is a sham. I believe everything Rachel said. Yeah. Uh, I hate this now. And, um, you know, it calls into question everything that Ariana has said or whatever, you know. Like, no, okay. I mean, it was all like, I totally believe everything she said. It was. It's just the weird thing to me is like, what is your goal? Ultimately, yeah. what are you doing next? Like, do you still want your entire livelihood to be built off of your affair? Yeah. Like, it just seems like you know it would seem to me that for her mental health if she spent so much time and money trying to get past this that reviewing it painstakingly for months and months and months yeah. to, in the public eye would be a bad idea yeah yeah you're i mean you're right and i was just going to say like i was just going to end our conversation by saying what we said last week which is like Rachel before you go too far you know and fully burn the bravo bridge Maybe in season 12, you know, there would be some way that you could come back. But I think ultimately that would not be healthy for her. And I don't know if she would be able to navigate the nuance of this sort of um, fanciful version of reality that the Vanderpump Rules cast is so adept at. I don't know if she would ever be able to actually get her point across. And she addressed that in the podcast. She said, I don't think I could ever turn the tides in my favor. I think that they'll accept Sandoval at some point, but I don't think I would have had anyone there on my side. So I don't know. I guess it's more of like me being a Bravo Didn't you fan. feel like the uh, producer was really kind of like uh, exaggerating when she was like, so we could see from uh, the preview of the new season that everyone has accepted Sandoval back oh, yeah. with loving arms. Do you think they would do the same for you? And I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, there were there were some horrible pointed questions and some <laughs> questions that sounded like they hadn't really watched the show. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess, you know, Rachel, if you do watch this, um, my advice is I think that possibly – there is a way that you could make season 12 a healthy environment for you and get your point across and possibly be welcomed back, even though there's this gap of you not being on the show in season 11, because they're definitely going to be reckoning with Rachel's loss on this season. I can say that as a, as mm. a tease. Mm-hmm. They're not doing the standard Bravo thing where it's like you don't mention someone that's not on the cast anymore. Right. They're talking about her yeah. a lot. Okay. So I think that she could do it and it still be a healthy environment, but um, I just... I don't I don't know I guess it's why be in this place like you just said where you are still operating on the the what's that the outer the outskirts of the Bravo universe right and trying to I don't know yeah be a part of it in a way that's like burning bridges and then I I guess scorning the actual thing when you could go back on the show and right. possibly be reclaimed by the Bravo audience yeah I feel like once Bethany opened her mind to the idea that she could say that this whole operation is bad yeah that she was like oh like yeah like every part of it is you know again she doesn't go too far overboard saying it was like abusive or whatever but that's kind of like the point of view is that it's like manipulative and like not real and you know you're kind of rewarded for doing certain things and punished for doing other things whatever um but i was thinking about uh the last thing i'll say just because Bethany started all of this yeah. since I've been watching old Roni. Uh, I just watched the season with Jules and how Bethany reacted to Jules and um, just the way Bethany reacts to people with more meek personalities in general. I'm like, I actually couldn't create in a lab a person that would have infuriated Bethany more than Rachel if they were on the same cast. Oh, yeah. If they were existing in the same space on the same cast, Bethany would have eviscerated her. She would have, like, ignored her, been mean to her, made her cry, called her dumb, like, called her, like, worse than a Bambi-eyed bitch. Like, she would have, like, turned her into pulp. Yeah. If they were together and now it's like, she's like, wow, they really treated you poorly. You need to tell your story. And I'm like, 
Bethany, you would have hated her. Yeah. And I think Bethany would say that like the Bravo environment <laughs> made that the the Bethany personality that came out because she knew that that's what they wanted. But no. it's not. No. That's Bethany's personality. And she was a heightened version of what she would actually say and do in all these situations. Like that's yeah. Bethany. The Bravo eth- ethos isn't what Bethany brought to it. Yeah. She brought her personality and it just shined because people liked that yeah. that quick wit and well, humor. I forgot and- how uh how unwell bethany is for so long like she's so like frazzled and like traumatized and like on the razor's edge for like many years yeah (laughs) and then i remember like the carol thing like comes at like a horrible time for her because i don't think bethany had a lot of like good friends and yeah to lose that that like sort of like broke her spirit so hard i can't wait i have a i took a break to watch gypsy rose but i will return you're having a good tv time i mean we're sort of like i don't know the bravo like we got a good bravo thing coming up but we're sort of like getting winding down of all the shows i know i feel like i have some time to delve into other things but um yeah i think was that all of our current updates yeah let me see i mean i think i we talked about the premiere we talked about rachel goes rogue we talked about the valley yeah um we don't really need to spend time talking about how Sam and Corey <laughs> broke up. I think, Shocking. I think they started in one of the, they had the worst start to a relationship of all time that we saw in the Winter House yeah. finale when um, he goes, I guess, or boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever. Yeah. Well, it sounds like she said that they broke up before the reunion, oh, um, they, oh, which okay. kind of makes sense because she was so upset during the reunion and he was just sort of like not talking. Yeah. Um, but yeah, my favorite quote from what she said was that um, like four days before Christmas this year, he texted her and was like, I just realized Christmas and New Year's is coming up. Are we like doing something or? I wonder what made him remember that Christmas was <laughs> coming on December 21st. Was it possibly that everything in the society around him was Christmas themed and every single thing he did and looked at was he was Christmas. like playing chicken like he was like maybe if i don't say anything we won't have to spend christmas together here's my takeaway on this very easy subject to wrap up <laughs> sam uh you're gonna do fine and it's a good thing that you and Corey broke up there will be someone in the world someone <laughs> out there who will treat you better than this person who treated you like absolute shit for a year or yeah, however what long a waste you're dating. of time awful and i'm sorry that Corey enticed you so much with his wonderful personality of <laughs> treating people like shit and bragging about himself and driving fast motorcycles or whatever the fuck is going on with him but you will find a better person that loves you sam i promise i didn't but I'm sorry that you had to go through that. Yes. Is that your takeaway too? Or maybe yes. too harsh? Okay, I, good. yeah, it, it's, it was hard to see that she didn't realize sooner. Yeah. But you know, you'll find someone else to spit in their mouth and light their <laughs> tongues on fire or whatever. Right. No, I'm just kidding. Twin she, flames. That was probably Corey's thing. That was not, but yeah. anyway, she'll do good. And then I think with that, let's, you want to honor ourselves with taking a certified turtle piss break? Yes. And then we'll return with Southern Charm. So let's talk about Southern Charm for people who waited to do the Southern or did the Southern Charm challenge with us, Salt Lake City, and yep. then the sort of <laughs> mid episode of Beverly Hills. The Beverly Hills Minute. Yeah. Right? Cool. Yes. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Let's go piss. <laughs> We're back. Hi. I feel um I feel good about our news segment, right? It was comprehensive. Was it good in terms of quality overall? I think so. Really? Yeah. Was there moments where you think people might have smiled or laughed? Yes. And were there times where people thought that was serious and deep, uh, <laughs> decisive commentary? I think so. Uh, sometimes, uh, as you know, and I know you agree, we forget every word we say almost immediately. And so then we'll get comments about certain things and I'll be like, we said that? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Like, well, first of all, I don't remember anything that we just said right now that we no. just talked about. But also I'll say things like everyone who pleads... <laughs> guilty is guilty oh. or whatever the hell and i'm like what the i know hell we have I to say? like do a formal apology i i will say up front i apologize for any <laughs> horrible thing we ever say that ever makes you offended <laughs> because yeah we didn't mean to undermine how corrupt the yeah. american judicial system is we know that it's we are for 
justice reform. <laughs> yeah, it's just this is all a completely unedited, free flowing conversation. And Amy and I will sometimes say horrific, awful <laughs> stuff that will alienate little turtle cuties. But if we say something like that and you thought it was bad, we're sorry. Yeah. And we'll. But I love that you keep us informed in a kind hearted way. Yes. Let us know when we're wrong. We will correct ourselves. Do you know some podcasts out there? <laughs> I don't want to name names, but they have horrible, horrible, evil, mean spirited fans that. <laughs> They yeah. comment and they'll be like, I hate all the Bravo cast members. They're <laughs> evil. And like, they have this horrible fan base that they have yeah. to deal with. We have, I think, 99% of the little turtle cutie community. They're sweet and fun and they never treat us badly. No, I get a little scared when any of our videos that we post online get any traction because I'm like, oh God, is this the time that everyone on earth hates us? Like like our like <laughs> when our Lindsay Hubbard video goes know, out to the like masses. It has like 50 comments, but honestly, 99% good comments. And when there's bad comments, everyone flees to our defense, which I love. Keep it's, that up, you guys. We're creating a community <laughs> of nice People who generally, for the most part, agree with our takes. I mean, we we had strong Roni season 14 takes where we were going to bat saying that like Jenna Lyons sucked on that show. <laughs> and like we were taking extreme stances. But for the most part, our little turtle cuties are with us. Yeah. And even if, you know, I mean, obviously, even if you disagree, I think people still appreciate us being true to yeah. our feelings. And as, as long as you can justify your take and it, sounds meaningful and sounds like it's authentic and we're just not like jeff lewis just coming up with controversial <laughs> takes to be an asshole and try to yeah. get clicks and um you know try to create fodder yeah um uh jimmy was saying that he whenever he browses like reddit for bravo stuff that everyone that listens to jeff lewis's podcast like you were saying like hates him yeah yeah he, he's <laughs> cultivated him as a as his personality is like I am evil and I hate everything and I'm mean. You get the fan base that you have <laughs> cultivated and they probably hate him and treat him like shit and he yells at them and like it's Did just, you see him on Watch What Happens? I saw um I don't like him at all and I think his personality is awful and I think that it's I don't believe anything he says. He obviously had the worst take on Monica that she's too poor to be a <laughs> cast member when she's the best casting decision that they've ever made in the history of Bravo or like, you know, in the recent memory. Yeah. So I hate his stupid takes that I think they're just He's just trying to generate controversy, yeah. but I did like his take on the Salt Lake City um, set. reunion set because <laughs> that was a good take that I would have and never he's said. he's a design expert, yeah. so he has some leg to stand on, but he also accidentally revealed that he's going to be on the new Orange County season, and Andy was pissed. I, I know. I saw that clip too, but I mean, why, why is it that big of a deal that he revealed that he's going to be like sitting down to dinner on the OC with right. someone? I, I mean, feel like they were really going to... Um, like use that tease for something is he gonna design heather's house or something is he a designer yeah but he's friends with shannon okay yeah so he, i guess andy is i'm mad surprised he hasn't been on before but, but he has been on bravo shows before right in the background of shit well you mean other shows other shows had show. in the bravo universe i mean probably i'm just saying i didn't know why that was such a big reveal i mean as I someone who doesn't know anything about him and never listens to him i was just like yeah i'm sure jeff lewis would be in a scene in the oc why sure. wouldn't he yeah i just enjoy sometimes that yeah um he's one of the few people that can kind of fuck with andy yeah <laughs> and, and, no, and, and, and actually what made him redeemable when he said that horrible mean insult about the set design which i will say <laughs> you know it is weird and it's a bad shit Bad shit. And I, 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 yeah. And then I like that Andy goes, we've made hundreds and hundreds of sets, beautiful sets. This is not one of our best. And I was like, okay, you got Andy to admit that he doesn't like the set design for yeah. Salt Lake City. That was, that was a good use of Jeff Lewis's evil energy. Yeah. I was like, you got Andy to admit something, you know? So yeah. I liked that, yeah. but I just don't trust anything else that he says. And he sounds like he just creates feuds and talks shit about people yeah. just to garner attention no, which he's is had like hundreds of feuds but it's interesting that he actually is kind of a valuable player in the bravo universe because he keeps those conversations going online like every time i open my tiktok there's something about what he said yeah. you know but that's just yeah i mean that's because that is his, that's that's sure. what he wants but like as far as someone going outside of your universe he is sort of giving them so much free fodder all the time you know he, he is creating fodder for bravo by yeah. 
creating all these feuds and everything? Yeah, because he talks about everything and it always becomes a headline. He's always feuding with like three housewives at any given time. So it's like he's basically creating like B plots. So he's getting uh, what he wants. Yeah. And Bravo's getting what they want. And his network or his show is on like Andy's radio or whatever. So he's like, uh, he's like, um, I don't want to say evil again, but he's like <laughs> the like a, the bizarro Andy, yeah. where he is creating like all the negativity and fostering storylines, whereas Andy is like the positive beacon of Bravo. Yeah, but like Andy likes him, even though he's yeah. like such a pain no, in the I, ass. Because Andy does like outspoken people, and the, yeah. the whole Bravo Foundation is saying talking shit and saying what you really feel and being honest. So I yeah. get why Andy finds him valuable. Yeah, yeah, and he's an OG, so I get it. You mean he's been on, I don't know, he's been on yeah, Bravo. Yeah, Flipping since. Out was like one of the early shows. So you like him generally? I mean, I think he's like a piece of shit, but I am entertained. And I watched Flipping Out for like many years. Oh, yeah. I, I was entertained by the by the interaction that he had with Andy about the set design. I was like, <laughs> that was cool that he got him to admit that. Yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Southern Charm Union part two. Yeah. So do you think there are little turtle cuties that have been doing the Southern Charm Challenge and are waiting for our commentary about last week's episode yes okay good <laughs> all right um i thought this uh reunion was great overall yeah like uh very very um i mean and honestly the fact that this is gonna be a two-parter gave validity to what you said why not just make them action-packed and awesome for two parts than always trying to string them out i was like this didn't lack for anything no. you know that it was just that this is only going to be two parts ultimately because this was jam-packed this was great I thought. Oh yeah, this is part one. Yeah, this is part one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We haven't, we haven't. Yeah. I think part two is is will be will have been on last night, and we won't talk okay. about that for a week. But this was part one, and it was surprising to me, mostly because I loved what Shep did. You know, for that ten minutes in there, what mm-hmm. he chose to do with with the reunion. I thought yeah. that was I never would have expected that, and I don't think there's a real strong precedent for that on any other reunion yeah i don't i usually truly honor the southern charm challenge and watch it like the night before we record but i started getting texts last thursday and i was like i gotta watch it right now yeah so yeah because it was unprecedented um did you like that he started out uh the episode by quoting napoleon yeah what did he (laughs) say about napoleon again he said that napoleon to quote Napoleon, never interfere with your opponent while he's making mistakes. It's rude. That is a really cool Napoleon <laughs> quote. And I remember when Joaquin <laughs> Phoenix said that in Napoleon. <laughs> and I just saw last night that Shep was watching Napoleon. And he goes, hashtag, I love history. Really? So he's not only was he thinking about Napoleon four months ago or two <laughs> months ago, whenever they did this reunion, but he's still thinking about Napoleon now because he just watched the Ridley Scott film. Wow. I wish we could run into him again and ask him all about what he thought. He said something like, it may not be historically accurate, but I love history, <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> so I, I think it's fun. I don't know. I, I, I mean, yeah, you have to say he does love history, right? He certainly says so. What did he say that... that wonderful napoleon quote about who was messing up so let them flounder because he was rude. talking about jt and he was it was like backstage while they were getting ready shep said that about jt no it was austin oh, oh okay Sorry. okay oh i was like yeah i know yeah so he's yeah he's he's saying that austin is basically you know making a bunch of missteps on his own right. he doesn't want to get in the way of austin right. fucking up and then later jt was also dropping historical references. He called Austin Commodus. Yeah. Um, that which is one, also Joaquin Phoenix. Crazy. I think, <laughs> I, I think JT and Shep might have rented a couple films before <laughs> the reunion got started. Um, his was less, I would say, uh, historical commentary and more g- Gladiator. You know, yeah. you watch Gladiator. Because yeah. I don't think Commodus was a real person he's based on he's an amalgamation of a bunch of um roman emperors or whatever but okay so he, that was more gladiator and then jt unfortunately <laughs> i'll say unfortunately called austin voldemort in a big bird costume now i don't necessarily think well first of all i don't think jt should have brought up voldemort uh, he who must not be named. First of all, we don't say his name <laughs> in polite society. Second of all, 
Uh, it's like the lowest hanging fruit for what you can call someone. Yeah. Even when Ariana called Rachel Voldemort, she said, Dementor. because I know you. Li- oh, sorry. Oh, right. Oh, she didn't even. Oh, wow. Even she, she didn't would go never to Voldemort. say the V word. You're right. So, he, <laughs> J- yeah, I just thought that JT and then he goes, well, he likes movies. So that's why I'm using He's it, a but- real movie guy, which, again, need more info there. Did he? Did he? Oh, I know. Oh, oh, like what movies Austin yeah. likes. Which, not to bring it back to Gypsy Rose, but they show that um, in, we know she went to see that Kenneth Branagh Cinderella, but they interview uh, like the manager of their local movie theater said Gypsy and her mom Dee Dee came in like three times a week. So imagine, I'm like, what movies did they see? There was one photo of them standing in front of a Dark Knight poster, like thumbs up. Please. <laughs> Please send me that screenshot of them thumbs up in, the, in front of Dark Knight, Dee Dee and Gypsy Rose. I love the idea of that. That was a great movie, Mom. Do you believe that? Um, joke? Could you believe Joker was doing that kind of shit in there? That's like, it's like a anyone, real fresh take. That's, that's why anyone watching movies is funny. Like any, anyone in the Bravo universe, I want to know their favorite movies. That's all I care about. We yeah. found out Whitney's. Like, thank you so much. Yeah. We know. That, like, anyway. Um, not to go yeah, on a rant, yeah, yeah. but that is, I love that Gypsy Rose watched Dark Knight with her mom, and they were movie fans. But isn't everyone a movie fan? Right. I mean, honestly, the people who say, I don't like movies and I don't watch movies are more of the anomaly in society. Yeah. Everyone loves movies. Right. I know. But they keep acting like Austin with his movie quotes and all this. Is JT purely going off the fact that he said him and Olivia send each other movie quotes? For sure he is. Yeah. And he thought that was something that was um, he brought with him as probably rehearsed to say yeah so that means he actively like thought i'm gonna call austin voldemort and i will say (laughs) that's a misstep i think bringing voldemort into this um you know reunion was a mistake it's it's very um uh, a cliched thing to bring up yeah and and, uh i think overall i liked some moments of jt I, i i'll spotlight the moments i really liked but i think his dug in demeanor of I am the anti Austin and I'm going to um, give him an exorcism in the middle of this room right now. It was um, not a nuanced, realistic like portrayal of himself. Yeah. It gave, it gave off a, a, like a lame vibe because that was his whole, that we already said his whole storyline was just being anti Austin for the entire run. And so that to keep that going with no other nuance was like a lame strategic move in my opinion. Right. Especially when, you know, we'll get to that serious Shep conversation. He was even doing it during that. And I was like, fuck off. I, that's, I, that's what I was going to say. That was the low moment. Let's just say it now. Yeah. So JT while Shep. So everyone's seen this and we're going to talk more in depth about the BravoCon yeah. thing. But while Shep is pouring his heart out, using this opportunity to talk to his f- real friends, yeah. people who are not JT, people yeah. who have been through Shep through the thick and thin. Austin is saying, I've been your best through friend through this or whatever. And JT dismissively, who doesn't know these people i mean no offense like but he's not a cast member he doesn't know shep really he goes that's your best friend whoa man i can't believe what i'm hearing it's like enough (laughs) this is not the time to use your fake hatred of austin or whatever however real it is but use this one-sided grudge against austin now when shep's pouring his heart out and no one would disagree that austin is a good friend to shep i mean andy threw a real bone uh defending austin saying like i saw with my own eyes the way he was supporting you during BravoCon." so jt's stance the entire reunion flopped because he ended up in moments where austin looked great and and (laughs) amazing and shep looked amazing for being brave and honest and then that demeanor uh, floundered because yeah. no one needed that take in that moment and you look like an asshole. Right. I mean, it's annoying. This was also annoying during the Vanderpump reunion where it's like, it's annoying to purely be in opposition of someone else. Yeah. You know, like you have to stand on your own and then if you need to like defend yourself or, you know, take some digs where you can, but if that's all you have, it's like, all right, well, what's your storyline? That's you know? it. Yeah. And, and um, I think Austin is right. I don't like him saying he's jealous or whatever, but Austin is right to just be like, like, what is your he's deal? Like, you're obsessed like, with me. You're obsessed. Like, and, and it's it's not obsessed, but it's like you are making the one thing that you want to bring to the show being to take me down. Yeah. You know, and whatever you think of Austin, he doesn't warrant like that amount of hatred from JT, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, 
it's like fine to be annoyed, but it's like it making it your whole personality is too much. I do think like even Craig and Shep are like just laughing at JT and because it's funny to hear someone like hate him so much, but they're also laughing because they know that it's kind of silly that he has made this his <laughs> mission. Right. You know? Like they're, they're he al- yeah. JT also implied that I think he was hung over. He was like, because I wasn't disciplined last night, I'm going to be unhinged today. And I was like, what? I was like, does that mean you're still drunk? Like, what is happening? Yeah, I think he just wanted to excuse, like, <laughs> like his, like, you know, demeanor the entire yeah. time or whatever. I also have to say that I watched the first time on TV and I watched the second time on Peacock. So my notes here are the X-rated Mine too. version, which was fun. Yeah, I like the X-rated one. They go more <laughs> into like um Shep and Austin having sex. <laughs> yeah. My next note is that Craig likes light bondage. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um and he said that his thrill comes from a female's joy and everyone was like, unlike you, Shep. And he was like, oh <laughs> Shep I mean, a through line of this entire reunion was um, everyone asking questions about <laughs> Shep's stance on not providing, you know, pleasure. He to really women. shouldn't have ran with that or like agreed publicly that that was true because it's not a good look. And he said, he's saying like, I was playing it up for cameras, Andy, or whatever. He tries to say that it wasn't true. And then Taylor, then Andy specifically <laughs> asked, and she said less than five times. Yeah. And then um, Shep, Shep, he said that his tongue gets tired. I was like, whoa, that is the Peacock edition right there. Yeah. And also, and then he goes, well, Shep or Taylor, why did you want to get back uh, with me? You wanted a life of sexual unfulfillment or whatever, which, you know, it's a good She was like, I mean, I had a good time, just, you know, didn't go all the way. And I thought it was kind of amazing that, um, because then everyone turned to Austin, was like, let's talk about your fulfillment of women's needs or whatever. And both Madison and Olivia, even though they both kind of hate him, couldn't help but compliment him madison said i stuck around for some reason for three years basically saying the sex was so good it kept around for three years and then olivia said i never had bad sex with austin so then shep is sitting there going oh god damn i look like a horrible lover and austin looks like don juan over there it was it 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 was just crazy that they like i was like they have no um motivation to say that like they don't it must have hurt them to compliment that's him. why you know it's true it's true <laughs> he was they, like oh yeah they had to admit it. and i was just sitting there letting that roll over him while like, well, jt's trying to insult him it's like i don't really mind madison He's and like, olivia just said bitch. i'm amazing <laughs> i have amazing sex um, um I, I, there was one moment this isn't that big of a deal just one of the small moments where austin is making fun of how jt looks at craig with like this awe in his eyes like he is hatred of austin but he loves craig or whatever and taylor was just actively laughing at jt with austin like i'm like taylor that is so horrible of you jt like professed his love he was on your side he was like your confidant this entire time and now here you are on the other side of the room laughing your ass off at austin making fun of jt about his like fawning over craig i just thought it was so rude yeah she's kind of like evil she is and and, and (laughs) honestly it's like it's like rachel on season 10 where it's like do you want to be the villain is Mm -hmm. that is that what you're actively pursuing or are you being misconstrued this entire time i think at the end of this reunion taylor is like I am going to be the villain, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, I quickly wanted to celebrate Craig's Sewing Down South win. I thought it was sweet that he, I mean, he said it was an eight figure business, yeah. which I'm like, I have to think about that. Well, six figure is a hundred grand. Okay. Um, so it means like multi millions, ten. like yeah. 10 plus. Ten, yeah. Yeah. Ten plus. And then he said that he has 30 employees with health insurance, which I thought was a cute thing for him to care about oh i like as a sign of success that was such a great way to put it yeah like everyone that was nice. has health insurance and i'm like i wish i had health insurance <laughs> <laughs> i mean i have covered there, california but it's i have like, covered california too yeah. i mean bronze pp yeah, yeah and, and i've gone through many years in los <laughs> angeles without any health insurance at all so it is something to tout and i'm very proud of him and i think that you know his storylines overall didn't get a lot of do because so many other things overrode what he wanted to show this season. We didn't yeah. get really a lot of sewing down south. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm curious about. It sounds like um his big uh client is Kroger, so he's basically a magnate of grocery store pillow sales. Yes, which I never see. <laughs> um, I go to Trader Joe's, I go to <laughs> Pavilions, and I don't see 
pillows. So I think that that's maybe it's in those sections like at the front or whatever. Where yeah, they sometimes show they have a little decor. patio section. Yeah. But good for I him. I mean, I'm, I'm proud of him. People were listing some of the biggest, you know, come ups in Bravo history. Um, and it's like you have to put. Craig in there with like Bethany people who were like written off for mm-hmm. years and then just come back well he's soaring. really changed I was talking to Jimmy about it who hasn't watched the new season and because I used to kind of low-key hate Craig at least during his like winter house era and like his Adderall era and when he was just like always pissed off and like acting too big for his britches and I've come a long way I think he's come a long way mm-hmm. and I was trying to tell Jimmy that he's changed and he was like he can't imagine and I'm like no I swear he seems so much happier he's like not an asshole he's doing well yeah I um (laughs) we've talked about this many times in turtle time but my first impression of Craig was from winter house season two and I was like this guy's a an asshole breaking (laughs) glasses trying to give money to Kyle so he can sleep in the better bedroom I was like this guy sucks not cleaning up but then I never had but then when I watched him from the very start I always felt like Craig was on the right side of history and everyone treated him like shit everyone Shep who was Cameron everyone made fun of him Naomi Mm -hmm. like they just you know they they thought he was like lame and would never do anything and then he showed them all and became one of the most popular cast members on Southern Charm yeah I mean it's kind of of amazing that he the pillows were sort of like a funny joke for a while as like he was just like uh listless and aimless and uh Naomi was like were you just making pillows all goddamn day and he was like I am I I am this is going to be something, I swear. I mean, I'm sure when Naomi watches that, it's like, I mean, th- you know, that was like awful how she treated him during that era. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, because it's like the exact opposite of what you hear, like with you would want your significant other to say, like, I'm drawing comic books in my free time because <laughs> I've always had a passion for drawing comic <laughs> books. And you're like, stop drawing. That's, you know, that that sucks. You'll never do anything with it. And then you become like, you know, whatever, you yeah, know, yeah, a major yeah. Stan Lee figure or whatever. It's like, yeah, my girlfriend used to berate me for spending my time doing yeah. this. Yeah. But in her defense, it really didn't seem like he was no. going places. At that. He has changed and figured out a better way because at the beginning, remember, it took him like six months to get a sample pillow yes. to Patricia. <laughs> yes. And then he united with that more business minded friend. Yeah. And that person really gets a lot of credit for <laughs> for getting that business in line. Yes. Um, if, if you didn't have anything, I wanted to spotlight for a second the the more um, details we got about Taylor's nude photo journey Yeah. pre-Southern Charm season nine, what she was up to. Yeah. And it wasn't only just come one, come all with a sort of um, I, I, whatever she said what did she say? She she said it was not nude, but then a right. lot of people countered and said you were nude during right. that. And I'm not I'm not bringing this up to shame her for the nudes or whatever. But we learned that it wasn't only that, but also Leva says she saw DMs or texts where where I'm gonna be I'm gonna say the words that we're saying you know in the uncensored. Come fuck me in Nashville to Whitney. Yeah. Like, and she was like, when was I in Nashville? Like she really played dumb on it. So, but I'm like, why would Leva say that? No, I mean, I, I, I believe Leva enough to know that she wouldn't just say that. At the she does it. She's like not a pot stirrer. And then she also, Taylor explained her motivation for why she was doing this. And I was just as confused by that. Even when she explained it, she said that she knew that Whitney and Shep were out on the town bringing girls back to Patricia's house, which I was like. Okay. And then she would know that they were doing that. So she would text Whitney saying, is this what you're looking for? And send him nudes so that I guess what Shep would see that, hey, um, uh, hey, Shep, just so you know, uh, Taylor's texting me naked photos asking if this is what I want. You know, this is what I'm looking for. It's just that whole strategy and her intentions are very odd. Right. And and why she was sending nudes to Whitney. I don't really understand it. Right. To make Shep jealous. Right. But he didn't tell him. He just showed everyone else. Yeah. And then Craig in the uncensored version goes even more doubles down on how horrible it is of Whitney to show these off. He goes, he wasn't showing these because of whatever reason they tried to say he was showing them because he thought it was odd or whatever. He goes, he was drunk and bragging about receiving these texts. And he said it was horrible of Whitney to do that. Craig has always hated Whitney. Yeah. I mean, good call. Yeah. Um, And uh, this is where Shep says that, um, he never got nudes from her because he doesn't like to see his girlfriends that way. And he, yeah. uh, you know, he likes to keep those 
separate. Yeah. Um, and then JT was like, I'm just amazed that Shep uh, doesn't like nudes and can't make a girl come. And I was like, huh. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, can you like quiet down over there? Like, can you just like relax? Yeah. Well, they go, JT, what are you huffing and puffing about over there? And he has this solemn look on his face and he says that. And I actually thought that was a funny moment. I'll give <laughs> JT that. But I understand. I know, but he was like making me nervous the whole time where I was like, what is he going to say now? Right. Like, just yeah. popping off in the corner. He he also like there were moments where uh, he wanted to make fun of of Shep too. Like he is the ambassador for all of the women on the show, and he was even trying to like bring it to Shep when Shep was having more like um what are those called like moments of like being honest, you know? And like I was like JT, why are you doing this now to everyone, even Shep, who I yeah. thought you're like fine with? I know it was weird. He seemed to be enemies with all. Yeah. And then they also reveal that Taylor has a new boyfriend that she met through a different JT, who apparently is on Southern Hospitality, right. which I have not watched. Me neither. Um, and it turns out this is the segue into BravoCon that Shep met him at BravoCon. Uh, in Shep's memory, it went fine, but in actuality, it sounds like he slapped Taylor's ass. And that her new boyfriend did not like that. We, yeah. And then he, uh, Andy's like, what do you mean you don't remember? And he's like, well, I, Andy's like, well, were you drunk? And he's like, yes. And he's like, and by the way, let's, I have something to talk about. Yeah. Um, and he basically, uh, he says that he has a mea, co- mea culpa uh, for everyone. He's at a crossroads that Bravo Khan was the impetus of that he was drunk and out of control in Las Vegas. He doesn't remember basically anything, and it scared the shit out of him. Um, which I'm like, if you're going to go off the walls, I can understand why BravoCon was the place, because it was wild. But yeah. um, Andy's like, he, he starts the conversation by saying, I know the answer to this, unfortunately, but can you explain what happened? And Shep goes, well, I can't because I was blacked out i was drinking margaritas and i had to watch what happens live and drink more and and he's like basically you were blackout all weekend and he says yes um i question whether there's more to the story there yes um because andy's like andy's saying i know what happened but can you explain and i'm like there's no way that the only answer to what happened is that he was blackout because I'm like, no. that doesn't seem extraordinary yeah. for Shep. So all of this is, I mean, like you and I both, I'm sure, are proud of Shep and where he got to. Yeah. And I am so proud of his honesty about this and where he wants to take his life acknowledging this. But I also got the same sense that you don't just be blackout drunk in Vegas for three days and only the only anecdote we have is that austin had to hold you up and that you smacked taylor on the ass which is horrible <laughs> that's already yeah uh, horrible and that he didn't know that is awful i mean no wonder taylor and her boyfriend fought or you know because <laughs> he just saw your ex-boyfriend come up and smack your ass at rhythm and riffs or yeah whatever. you know it's like that's horrible and i do think that they didn't want to get into any specific example of other horrible shit he did they just wanted it to it to be like shep was blackout he doesn't remember anything but um, it made him, you know, get to this point. But I bet knowing how chaotic Vegas is and how chaotic we saw at yep. different points at BravoCon that he was, he is so susceptible to getting into a lot of trouble if you're blackout drunk. I think that's the, the easiest way I can yeah. put it. There are so many ways for him. A man with a debit card. A man with a debit <laughs> card around a bunch of fans blackout drunk is a recipe for disaster. So I... I, I'm, you know, he doesn't need to tell us on, on the reunion. He was yeah, already yeah. honest enough. Yeah. But I know that there are going to be other anecdotes that they didn't want to talk about specifically where it made everyone concerned and write him off in that moment. They yeah. just didn't want to get into it specifically. Right. Yeah. Um. Andy shouts out Austin. Um. He goes, you know, just so you know, uh, Austin was really taking care of you all weekend, trying to make you presentable and, you know, working to keep you afloat all weekend um which you know we saw and i we talked about a lot of this on our patreon BravoCon recap because we had multiple interactions with shep um shep is is probably the most consistent interactions we had throughout the entire weekend right weekend in that recap which 
you know, you can listen to that. We go into detail across the board of every single Bravo Liberty interaction that we had over the course of the three days. Um, I will say, I mean, yes, whenever we interacted with him, he was very drunk. It was usually very late at night. But I will say watching in general, because of this conversation I've seen on TikTok, a lot of like, you know, on TikTok, it has like this recommended search. Yeah. It'll be like Shep BravoCon and I'll click on that and just watch everyone's footage of him the whole time. And it's kind of astounding that he was able to do everything he needed to do. Like he did watch What Happens Live. He did meet and greets. He He did did the panel. panel, And he was seemingly fine like you could be like oh like shep's like been drinking but like you weren't like jesus christ and he had good points at the bravo con panel (laughs) he talked about like him aging out of the show or whatever he was like the show started with thomas ravenel being 52 so we're not even close to that so yeah good point shep which is maybe the scariest thing of all yeah it's like how high functioning he is where it's like he doesn't remember anything from the entire weekend and yet we saw him do his contractual duties for three days straight beginning to end we our friend did a photo op with him at five o'clock on Sunday. They had fun moments with him. Yeah. Good interactions <laughs> that were Shep, you know, indicative of Shep's personality. So he was able to maintain I he was able to yeah, do everything. Yeah, he, he wasn't needed, like needed missing. And I and I'll say from my perspective, which you're you were even, you know, you had more interactions with Shep than I did, but I just thought he's blackout he's very drunk in Vegas at three AM at a bar at at BravoCon. Yeah. Nothing is more sanctioned in, you know, for him to just be letting off steam and getting really drunk. I would expect every Bravo Liberty, if they were partying, to like get drunk. I didn't know that that was a current throughout the entire weekend. Yeah. When I, the, the time I saw him. Yeah. Cause when we saw him, it was so late at night that it's like, well, yeah, it's yeah. the end of the night. But I was, I remember thinking when we were there, like, geez, like, is this how fucked up he gets always? Yeah. You know? I didn't, th- I gave him more, I, I gave him more grace to just think that that was maybe just like it was a saturday and i was like he just got drunk as hell but it it is dangerous as a bravo liberty i'm not gonna say dangerous but it is like i would have been more careful if i were him to be in that environment and be that blackout drunk even for a few hours just because of like what could happen to you in in vegas surrounded (laughs) by a bunch of fans and you are technically like working yeah (laughs) yeah and like because we would see we saw Austin uh, at the same time and he was out late, but he was like so seemingly sober. Yeah, like he maybe. was very like mild mannered and just kind of like sitting there like casually. Drinking. He wasn't fucked yeah. up at all. And like, um, so, uh, so, I mean, yeah, to make this about us, we're <laughs> happy that Shep apologized to us for his beca- behavior to us specifically at BravoCon. I felt like that he was reaching out through the TV to us <laughs> right. to apologize. I know it really hit close to home. But then, um, well, I mean that, that. So yeah, but I guess just to just to plug one last time, like we did recap this entire thing and in our interactions with Shep on our Patreon. So if you want to listen to that full thing, there's a lot of anecdotes surrounding this, but yeah. anyway, moving past that, what I thought in addition to Shep um, talking about this all is that Craig and Austin as real friends have been dealing with this for a really long time, yeah. much longer than I thought mm-hmm. that Shep's, uh, relationship with alcohol has been this bad for a long time to the point where they both personally had to write him off because there's no way that they thought they could get him better right they ditched his self-imposed intervention that was real because i'm like okay whatever these cast members relationship on the show that they have to like go to group settings together and they have to pretend that they have this camaraderie or whatever Actually, in reality, Craig and Austin are very much there for Shep to the point where, as friends, they have to let him just make his own decisions because they've been through this so many times with him. And I know people who have gotten to that point where it's like, there's nothing you can do for someone that is going through that. You've tried so hard. It keeps happening again. And only they can get themselves better. So that was, was, to me, a shocking revelation that that Craig and Austin have like been through this with Shep for so long. I know. And Craig was saying... Uh, he was like, the road you're on leads to a cliff and I can't be in that car anymore. And he was saying, um, Craig said he hasn't uh, drank uh, 
liquor in two yeah. years and that even this summer he had to reassess and basically doesn't drink anymore which also we saw at bravo con we went to Paige's birthday party at like a hardcore like the club uh, mm-hmm. like an oonts oonts club hakasan hakasan and craig was drinking water like i very much noticed that as an onlooker i was like he's not partying at all well and i thought that was more indicative of like how not the vibe that right. place was totally <laughs> but um yeah no i i i was also i i was i didn't know that craig also was like completely toning back his drinking which is know? why he looks amazing he's yeah. like never looked better yeah it's, you think you, i you, hate for that to be true because I know what I should be doing, but I, he looks amazing. <laughs> he does. He's like glowing from within. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, yeah, that was great. And um, I, and it really like, okay, so when you're watching a reunion and we're like, this is like real, like we're, we're watching these things that are real. But then like when you hear something like this, where Shep's talking about his alcoholism, or not alcoholism, sorry, oh. relationship with drink, whatever, they bordered on saying that, but relationship with alcohol. And then you find out like what's really going on behind the scenes. Like it broke the fourth wall. Yeah. Like, cause they didn't want to make that a storyline. Craig yeah. and Austin had enough respect for Shep to not bring up that they were, see- they've been dealing with all yeah. this shit. With they didn't Shep. pull a, a Kyle Richards in the yes. limo. Yes. Um, but yeah, this is where, um, yeah, Austin is saying, uh, you know, I'm your best friend up here, blah, blah, blah. And um, we had, we saw, again, this is on our Patreon, but when we met Austin, our friend took a photo with Austin and on, if we zoomed in on the photo, he's holding his, we, no, she, she took a photo with Shep yeah. and his phone, he had been trying to call Austin. Yeah. And then later we saw Austin, we were like, did Shep get a hold of you? And he was like, no, like I'm sick of it. Yeah. And I thought that was more like, they're not actually good friends. And like, he was bothered uh, yeah. by, by Shep. And it's like, I don't want to hang out with Shep on my off time. Cause we hang out all the time with other charm. Like that was my read. Uh-huh. But it turns out like he had been dealing with like running Shep around babysitting for... all weekend. Yes. I also saw on, in some comments that apparently at one point Shep lost his phone and fans found it and they were trying to give it back to him and he ran away from them because he didn't want to deal with fans and they were like we have your phone please stop like we're and he's like get away from that's me. the kind of shit I'm talking about we saw like maybe three scenes that painted a picture of what Shep's Bravo Cut experience was and we have no we barely scratched the surface on what the hell he was dealing with yeah the I saw weekend. some other comments that said he was like punching and kicking an ATM machine at another point he was like bullying his like blackjack dealer yeah i i heard that anecdote as well <laughs> given all of that it makes shep admitting to it all the more brave on this reunion i just want to I, I i have to give shep credit for making this a part of the reunion a real thing that he's really going through and now he's going to be accountable to the audience as right. well not just his friends i was like well now you said it so now everyone's going to be like Okay, yeah. well he, now he, we're watching. He's like it's like James Kennedy now. We're we're actively wherever James Kennedy is in his sobriety, the audience cares. We have to it has to be explained to us what James's relationship with alcohol is because he yeah. made it a part of his story. Right. Um yeah, and this is where uh, Andy sort of clarifies. I also love cuz Andy's totally like bros with all of these guys, so yeah. he kind of fit in perfectly and it felt like he was more on their level and like is friends with Shep like he loves Shep and you're he really, loves Craig you're right about like his camaraderie with the Southern Charm guys he loves there is them. something very deep about his like reverence for them did you see he did pillows and what's it called beer pillows and beer pillows and beer yeah, yeah. I did see that I didn't see any clips but I thought that was so nice of Andy to do that yeah he loves them um and he was like Shep Craig and Austin are at the end of their rope is what they're saying. Um, And Craig's like, yeah, you need to put some effort in because we've heard this all before. Mm -hmm. And this is where there was a little bonus footage on the Peacock version where Shep was talking about how sometimes you have a million people around you and feel all alone. And then you do things that are shameful. And he was saying how shame and alienation are a dangerous cocktail. And he said he's like never felt shame to this degree and that um, he's like, you know, I fancy myself a smart and clever guy. And he's like, but then I'll like, you know, basically get fucked up and be like, well, are you that? Are you just a worthless idiot? And then they cut to JT, who was like basically making a face of like, yeah, you are a worthless idiot. And I'm like, he's talking about like basically like wanting to be dead. Like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, it was like um, bad timing, JT. Um, and yeah, uh, it was horrible. And, you know, uh, there was, there was alienation with, uh, Shep 
at BravoCon. I mean, like mm-hmm. he was a drift mm-hmm. there and who knows if it's because Austin and Craig have gotten to the point where they don't want to be around when he makes mistakes like that and does that. Or if, I, I mean, I don't, I just, he was alone. Like literally he was isolated with yeah. only like maybe a couple people who he doesn't really value their opinions or whatever, you know, it's like, I don't know. I, yeah. I just, I feel bad for him. And uh, I think, you know, it was a great first step. Yeah. And he was, he basically is grappling with, um, you know, that he can't do what he used to do. Yeah. Like he's taken his like Peter Pan lifestyle yeah. as far as it could possibly go. Yeah. Um, and he's like, it's a tough pill to swallow because I'm Mr. Fun Guy. Like that's his entire persona. Like he was saying, Craig has his pillows. Uh, Craig and Austin have the podcast. Like everyone's thriving in their f- next phase and he has nothing here, to here, do. Here's what Shep can do. I, I just thought of it <laughs> like a bolt of lightning. First of all, I was thinking Shep could start a podcast tomorrow and it would have... 20,000 downloads and it could yeah. be about his sobriety journey. It could be about his relationship History. to alcohol. It could be, you no. Know, and then, and then, so I first thought that I was like, Shep, if you want a podcast, just start one. You will have a lot of listeners. You'll feel so good. Do it. I was thinking Shep's book club would hit like a ton of bricks yeah. in the Bravo community for us. If he was like this week, I'm reading the Napoleon biography because I'm so Napoleon pilled right now. Yeah. I would read along with Shep in a minute it would be sure. fun because it would be really um like dense books but yeah. then he would talk about it in a fun way for sure he could be like and, and we would get a peek into what he's interested in historically he's an <laughs> avid reader i assume he talks about it all the time yeah so if he just wanted to make that a thing like a community of chefs book club because books and bravo besides bren's valiant effort to bring books to the forefront of bravo it's not, there's not a lot of literary, <laughs> but Carol really yeah. brought a literary reverence to the Bravo um, universe. Yeah. But if Shep wanted to make that his niche, that would hit hard. I yeah. would be so stoked. Yeah. He just needs to get his act together and have the energy to do something. And, and my whole point, you don't have to take my advice about that, Shep, about starting a book club. <laughs> but I'm just saying if you did want these things, they are attainable. You know, it's just a matter of you putting in the effort and the audience will come because people care about Shep. Yeah. And he has a good way with words. He does. Um, but yeah, I was glad that um, they, this whole conversation happened and Andy's like, okay, so I'm hearing you talk about your you know, problems with alcohol, but what are you doing about it? Like, have you quit drinking? And he goes, no. Yeah. He goes, just no liquor, no shots. And everyone's like, what the fuck? Like, Madison's like, I thought he was saying he was going to go to rehab. I know. Like, Craig is like... uh that's where he reveals he hasn't had liquor in two years, but everyone's like, I'm pretty sure Shep has said this before. Yeah. And he said that he said, yeah. I think I, I've heard you get to the place where you were only going to have beer. Yeah. And, uh, I think he's, I think he's towing the line of which I dropped the word, which I shouldn't have, but I think he's towing the line of, of making this, like I have a disastrous relationship, life ruining relationship with alcohol versus I can maintain this sort of similar to James Kennedy where it's like, yeah. this is not a, a full problem for me. I'm not acknowledging fully. I'm just going to be more responsible with my drinking. And and a lot of times people learn that they can start to excuse behavior, even with that one caveat that they're permitting and it leads to the same behavior. Yeah. So that'll be the next, I keep saying bridge, bridge he has to cross <laughs> Yeah. if he wants to maintain. Cause I think ultimately he might have the same problems with beer that he had, even with shots sure. and liquor. Yeah. So. Plenty of people have problems with beer but um plus you'd have to ch- like you'd be like oh i'll have 12 beers tonight i mean gonna get drunk like i don't know it's uh, like it's not as um i don't know it's daunting yeah filling <laughs> feel like that's what i meant filling. <laughs> um but yeah this is where like taylor chimes in and she's sort of like she was getting emotional that whole she, time she was good her, her interactions with shep i, I liked everything she did in relation to shep was good yeah i'm so glad to hear you say this yeah she says she knows the real shep um and uh he's basically he says throughout this whole thing i feel like he was more um open to be honest about the level that his and taylor's relationship was at because i feel like before he was kind of like yeah we're done i'm done with that whatever and at this he keeps being like those were the happiest days of my life he says you know she always wanted me to sort of like get my drinking together but i'm a year too late and that's a big regret he says at one point that um if he wasn't on the show and like in all this 
chaos that they would probably be married, which I was like, is he joking? No, I think he really that meant it. That was like crazy. Yeah. I mean, I and I think if you ask why he said that, I think um, because of the notoriety and fame that Bravo brings, it, it adds a lot of um, new people into your world, especially yeah. if you're just like drunk and at a bar. Yeah. And I think a lot of his like cheating incidents and stuff like that might have, you know, been prevented if he wasn't a Bravo celebrity. Right. So I think that's what he's saying that the, the, a little bit of like the, the fame of the show led to their downfall. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. And so Vanita chimes in and basically says like, it's great that you are trying to like slow down and like dial it back, but you probably need to quit completely. Yeah. And Shep, <laughs> Shep's like, I know he always shakes his leg, but he's like, you can tell he's like panicked at that idea. Yeah. Like he like can't even think about that. He's like, okay, anyways, yeah. like let's I mean, move on. Alcohol is so much a part of his life and it probably has been since he was, you know, drinking age. And so it's like, it is so, I think, um, just too much to admit that like you can't ever have a beer again you know right. it's like it seems just i guess too... yeah it's literally like who am i yeah um and then uh yeah leva says you know you're gonna want to need you're gonna want need to want something more the yeah. way like craig has like his career and Paige like that's more important to him um you know he's like she's like whether it's that you want to get married to taylor or do whatever like you need to want something more and andy's like you might you know have to decide if you want this as in the show mm -hmm. more because it's not a healthy environment if you're in a bad space because it's like all about drinking and like drama yeah um so that was kind of like i'm like was that like a threat <laughs> i think i think andy was being just real yeah and really was trying to think about the show's impact on shep's life and just mm -hmm. offering that but shep didn't allow for that possibility at all he didn't right. say like i will think about that it's like i think if anything he would make the sobriety a part of his journey on the show next yeah. season if you know right um yeah and so then when they wrap up that conversation um and he's like good job buddy and he's like uh chef's like was that too much like was that too dark and he was like no it was great was sweet um and i'm like are you kidding it's the best tv ever oh, yeah you, you just <laughs> you just made this reunion so much more impactful than a typical reunion would be by getting like real like that yeah, like unexpected. you broke the format it was great and i wanted to say again um for shep like we we tout craig's transformation as a person and like where he got to but shep honestly was bordering on chaotic evil at the start of Southern Charm, like his relationship with women, uh, his relationship to Craig. And I do notice a huge difference in overall in Shep's um, personality, mm -hmm. like, and, and how he treats people. It's just more understated than Craig's. It's easier to pinpoint Craig's, but Shep has also gone through a, a transition as yeah. a person, I think. Yeah. And better. I think he would still be entertaining, like, you know, Craig is still entertaining without being fucked up. Oh yeah. Um, I think Shep would totally still be to like really enter his person. He has a good personality. He's funny and yeah. like clever. Um, honestly, at this point when they get really messy, it's like, it's not entertaining. It's kind of gross. Yeah. Like when you're talking about the alcohols yeah. Uh, relationship. Yeah. Like when they got really, really drunk at, um, in, in Jamaica in Jamaica and it started to spiral out into just chaos of, drunken chaos wasn't that entertaining because they're all just off their game they're fighting about bullshit it doesn't they're make not, sense they're like hiccup mad for drunk. no reason yeah it's like so alcohol really is it's good for the like get your nerves for the two first drinks or whatever but seeing just people just drunk like you know so drunk right. it's not that entertaining. well it's like how it's like what ended up happening with like sonia and dorinda where yes. it's like all right i can't watch this anymore oh. like i it's fun to watch people drink and get a little yes. crazy and there's some iconic moments that come out of it but after a while you're like this dorinda is dark is, dorinda's stabbing herself <laughs> sonia's falling down on a table on her face and going to get, having to have urgent care come to her yeah if there is a limit to how entertaining alcohol is and how entertaining it makes you yeah um i was thinking another podcast idea for shep shep <laughs> Carl, James, Sober Boys. Yeah. And they talk about how to live life in an alcohol-soaked universe, 
how we're so alcohol pilled and how it's responsible for everyone's fun, they think, and how it's so hard to be deprived of it. They all made drinking a part of their personality and then now are on Bravo navigating a non alcohol world. Yeah. That would be interesting to hear all of them. And also that chemistry, who knows what the hell that would be like. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> James, I feel like Shep, James is Carl. the wild card there. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw James in. I wanted Carl and Chef because that would actually be great. James <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if James would be committed to doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But is, you, you think that's an okay idea, sober boys? Yeah, I like it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so the end of the conversation is Andy on their way out saying, you really have to relitigate your relationship with alcohol. And, and and that's a moment, like you said, where you can see Andy's love of Shep. It's so yeah. sweet. Which Talking I feel to him like off camera. it was so real because, first of all, Andy loves those boys because he's kind of... In, basically until he had his kids, but kind of still like a party boy. Like yeah. he also took his Peter Pan lifestyle as long as he humanly could and yeah. probably still does more than most men his age. Yeah. Uh, and I think he relates to them and never, he like defends them yeah. forever yeah. for being able to, being allowed to just yeah. be party boys and do whatever they want. Um, so I think he was kind of like sad that it like took it's come to an end. Like the yeah. party has come to an end. Um, but Andy also, like if you read his books, keeps an eye on his alcohol, not to oh, yeah. a like, you know, distressing degree, but he always says like he takes a break before Bravo con, like, yeah. cause he has a job that historically he drank every night, yeah. which I'm like, I would die. Like, I don't like, I only drink on the weekends really. Cause I only drink socially, but if I had to have like a whiskey every night and a shot ski, yeah. like I would feel like shit all the time. Yeah, he's yeah <laughs> for sure. And yeah, he's, he's gotten to a place with his alcohol, alcohol where he knows he needs to take months long breaks, you know, yeah, from it. You notice like sometimes on watch what happens, he's drinking tea Yeah, or like won't do the shot ski or it will be like full disclosure. I'm doing like a water shot ski or whatever, which I'm like, yeah, I mean like I'm impressed that he did it as long as he did. Like yeah. wild. Me too. Um, Andy's a force for good. I think so. Don't you think? <laughs> People think he's like evil and maniacal and like operating everyone like puppets, like Bethany said. But like ultimately, when you see Andy off camera and hit him at Q and A's off the cuff, I agree with most everything he says. Like, yeah, you know. I mean, he's like a such a high functioning human being. Yeah. I feel like there's like only a handful of people. Like it's like Oprah, Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> Like his, his uh, nemesis. Andy, uh, like Sir, like Gail King, like yeah. people that just can be that busy and operate on that high of a level. Like yeah. I could absolutely never. Oh yeah, me neither. Um, um, oh, oh, well, so I want to say just to get us to the final point of yeah. this reunion. So they go from this beautiful, sweet moment. Everyone's hugging. Shep was, you know, brave or whatever. And then... Um, I don't know how it comes up. Do you rem do you possibly remember how Taylor gets this wonderful segue in of something that she's been waiting to say the entire reunion to make Olivia look like shit? Well, so they get back into um, the they are all as a group are talking about how it's that everyone is offended more that Austin and Taylor oh, lied right. than what they actually the cover up did. was worse than the crime. Exactly, Watergate. exactly. Um, and and Taylor starts to be like forgive as you would like to be forgiven a threat and uh and he's like wait what and she says forgive as you would like to be forgiven and like i wouldn't have thought anything of that Me neither but then olivia's like i see what you're saying just go ahead and do it i can tell that you want to so just do it so i'm like how did she even like they were like uh, like communicating telepathically. Yes, there was some telepathic <laughs> energy going across the room, but also I think Olivia knew that Taylor had that in her back pocket to use at any time, and it could have been brought up in the season. So the minute Taylor said those words, Olivia knew exactly what she was talking about and was only debating whether Taylor would be that horrible of a person to bring it out. Right. And then... She gives Taylor the opportunity to say, I'm not going to bring it up or not. And just mm -hmm. Taylor does it. She goes, the whole Thomas situation. And Andy goes, Thomas Ravenel? <laughs> <laughs> and Olivia's like, yeah. Uh, I was fresh out of college. I was like 20 years old. One drunken night, one time. I wanted to take it to the grave, obviously. Yeah. Which I'm like, and then they reveal that 
Madison brought it up at the last reunion. I had no memory of that. Me neither. So Madison brought it up to use against Olivia because it must have been a rumor going around. Madison brought it up because, I don't know, she must have been mad at Olivia or whatever. Um, And then Taylor defended Olivia strongly, saying that absolutely never happened. Why the hell would you do that? Took all the energy away from Madison's Mm -hmm. rumor spreading. Yeah, she's like, he's a family friend. Yeah. And then Olivia told Taylor... Hey, don't defend me so hard. Don't ride for me so hard. That actually did happen. But only them, I knew that it was confirmed and not a rumor like Madison brought right. it up. Yeah. So then she says it and it's used um, in a villainous way. I mean, there's no real um, like good read of why Taylor brought this out other than to malign Olivia's character to show that she's no better than Taylor. Right. Which everything Taylor is doing, every move she makes, just reinforces why Olivia now hates her. Yeah, she should. She should. She should this never now, go back. First of all, I never thought that Olivia could ever be friends with Taylor again, just from her screaming to her brother on her phone saying, I don't regret anything I did. She's overreacting. They never dated. That's already horrible. Yeah. Then now to use the one piece of information you you knew that's negative against me at the reunion is yeah. awful. She, she could, it's it's um, irredeemable. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, Andy's like, so why is that like relevant or whatever? And uh, Taylor's like, well, you know, it's like the exact same situation. And, you know, with Catherine and she's like, I didn't even know Catherine then. And I don't even know if they were together. Like, I still don't know. Um, and she's like, you're, you were a shitty friend, but now it's clear you're a shit human as well. Um, and Andy's even like, why he's, is that the same? Yeah. Like, he's like, why is that so bad? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, he doesn't um, get it. And as we know, since then, Catherine has posted photo of her and Olivia and been like, nothing to apologize for. Like, We've I never don't give been a shit. Closer. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it, um, it, it flopped. It flopped to Andy. It, 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 and it, 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 in every way it flopped because it sucked as a dig. Yeah. It, no one agreed that it was um, the same. And also you just outed yourself as a shitty person. And now <laughs> Olivia is going to hate you forever. And you just reinforced forced why Olivia hates you and why this whole the whole audience has not liked you this season right oh my god on the Jeff Lewis watch what happens uh, Mercedes from Shaw's was also on hmm. and they had like a hot take or like my unpopular opinion at the end of the episode and one of Mercedes uh takes was that she was like bring back Thomas Ravenel what did he do that was so bad and Andy goes we'll talk later really <laughs> yeah. I like that well wow, that's a funny I was moment like, yeah uh we don't you don't want to talk about that on watch what happens live <laughs> what did he do that was so bad it's like Andy goes uh. he's like we'll talk Wow, that's great. Wow, that's <laughs> but great. it was like shocking. I mean, Taylor sucks, but that was like a crazy bombshell just because it's like a ghost from the past. Yeah. Like we're like, we don't talk about him anymore. Like that's crazy. And it's crazy that he just gets every 20 something girl fresh. Like I'm like, what is what does he say to these women? Well, you know, he is uh, before, I don't know what before Southern Charm he was working with other than being like wealthy and a famous Ravenel legacy or whatever. But now, you know, if he's partying in Southern Charm, he is, you know, uh, notorious and people at that, in that era, you know, were there, you know, there's people doing the same thing. I'm not saying Sandoval and Ravenel are equivalent, but I'm just saying there are people that want to be around. I know. It's you. just like, how different is Charleston where that man can hook up with a 20 year old he wears like khakis with a belt and like a golf shirt like at least like sandoval like he's like so cheesy but he's like in a, the party scene and has like the air of yeah. youthfulness or cool it's to some what people the first season of southern charm is about is yeah, about like how these danny like yeah. he like fully dated danny and yeah. then got Catherine. yeah he like it's just like what is happening it's like that got men in charleston in that era had like like it was like I, I forget the ratio of like women to men or something, right. but it was like men had all of the power in those relationships, and so I think that's just like representative of that. So bleak. Yeah, it's awful, and um, I mean, yeah. So I think I mean your read on that is that did, is this a flop of Taylor because she thought that this would go over well, or is she embracing the villainy that she has been that's been hefted upon her after watching the season? I think she has season? like no tools left in the box. And she was like, this was a Hail Mary. So knowing that like her relationship with Olivia would never uh, recover, this is my last. Yeah. um, I also don't think she's good at being strategic. Like, I think she will regret this. Um, But she just, she sort of like blows shit up and like 
gets all worked up like she did in Jamaica and then with her brother and like every like she gets all like indignant. Yeah. And then it's like, you're going to regret this. Like you're going to have to defend your bad behavior. Also, again, I'm sorry to be morbid, but no mention of her brother. Are they Um, saving that or has that not happened? Right. No, it has happened because we talked about this Why wouldn't they bring that up first? Uh, There is something about Southern Charm where they don't want to be morbid and like bring up shit because they haven't given a segment to olivia grieving have they at the reunion well i don't know i, yeah. I don't know maybe they're saving that for part two because that's going to be a big deal when they yeah and, and it just now, feels weird not to mention it you're totally right can i just say one um turtle time take really quick yeah. that i just thought of in the moment yeah i think rachel levis would have done better on season 11 of vanderpump rules than taylor did on this season of southern charm yeah I mean, it's obviously debatable and it's obviously, um, I mean, I could go into it more, but I honestly feel like there was more of a chance for Rachel to be redeemed uh, in that environment than how Taylor is handling handling herself in the Southern Charm environment. Mm -hmm. So if Rachel ever wants to see how bad it could have gone and, you know, potentially how she could have done better than she should watch Southern Charm and see how Taylor handled the fallout from. Yeah. uh, I want to see like a simulation of what Rachel would have done because- On one hand, I could imagine her being like, I finally have the upper hand in that. Like, I'm the only ha- other half of this affair that can say honestly what happened. And she has like the truth on her side or whatever. But at the same time, I don't think that she has the backbone to produce herself or protect herself from producers. Not that I think they're like evil schemers, but right. like... I think she could have easily just gotten like trapped back into the cyclone of yeah. the show and not understood how to hold her ground. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. This whole, I was just thinking the whole, this whole Southern Charm season was like a less horrific scandal in every way. Yeah. Like a low level scandal, like a more realistic right. scandal. And in it's the, true that the cover up was worse than the crime. If it, it was truly just initial honesty like yo we were partying we made out that was fucked up i'm sorry it, and yeah. then that was it and then everyone could decide whether or not to forgive them it would have been not a big deal but instead we talked about it for like a year yeah and even now like i saw a clip from next week and all the comments are like get over it yeah, like i, mean, I don't want to talk about this anymore like yeah. We have to be done after this. Yeah, and they will be. They'll, yeah. you know, they'll, ne- they'll never talk about it again. It was only because like Whitney was releasing it to page six at the time right. that they were on that trip that it all got reinvigorated again. Right. You know, like there was there was reasons why it kept getting brought up and why they kept having to reckon with it. You know, so yeah, for I don't sure. Know. Um, all right. Well, I before we go on the ski slopes of or the pirate ship. I have to do a certified. I'm in a certified turtle piss tube. I will say <laughs> you and I are possibly, with the way things are going, going to go way past our typical yeah, turtle we're going to have to be efficient. We, let's be efficient about Salt Lake City because it was almost, you know, not as good, but very good yeah. and worth talking about. On and then par. Beverly Hills, maybe we give that short shrift this week. I don't yeah. think anybody's really We might craving. combine it with next week or something. Yeah. Okay. All right. All so right. Let's, let's piss and then we'll be back. Okay. Two certified turtle piss breaks. We're, I hope that's the last one. I think, unfortunately, I think there's going to even be one more. We might <laughs> break our record to have three certified turtle piss breaks. Um, we, I'm, we're doing more. It, this year, you and I have yeah. been sort of pissing our brains out more. What does it mean? Because you were getting to a better place with your <laughs> I piss. Know. Do you remember? At yeah. Towards 2023. Yeah. And then I feel like some seal got broken with us. And now we're sort of like... I know. I'm drinking a cold brew today, which is not what I usually drink. And I feel like um, it's taking me forever to drink it because it's so intense. Yeah. And I think it irritated my bladder. I think that's what's going on. (laughs) I was going to tell you that, but yeah, that's definitely what's going on. So if you're keeping track at home with your Turtle Time Piss scoreboard, Amy and I are at two now right we should get one of those you know when you're um in elementary school and you get like stickers for like reading books or like doing chores of course we should do it for piss breaks and monitor of course of course so you mean monday through or sorry (laughs) it would just be thursdays when we record and it would say one piss break two three (laughs) little turtle stickers that's amazing yeah oh good well yeah if you're keeping track that was two for this episode and it's been two for i think the last two episodes two for two two for two okay okay so let's talk about enough about piss 
Let's talk about Salt Lake City and the reunion part two. Season four. Yes. Of the reunion uh, part two. Yeah. So again, again, we're saving Reality Von T's for part three. You know what I mean? Which is very, I'm sure, annoying for <laughs> some people yeah. who only want to talk about that. Yeah. So it's kind of like this whole reunion being in parts is sort of hindered by them backloading every the biggest most explosive detail so i do feel like there is some people who are getting tired of them not addressing the one thing that everybody wants to talk about sure. and the black eye and the black eye <laughs> so they're saving so i think ultimately reunion part three will be what everybody loves yeah. and cares about and we're sort of having to go through you know the two parts before we get to what we really care about but um i still found a lot of uh, you know, merit to this reunion. I yeah. still enjoyed watching it. And there was a lot of revelations, even though they're not the biggest revelation in the world, they're still entertaining to me or interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, I'm glad that we got to revisit and recap the Monica and Linda, her mom yeah. um, dynamic, because regardless of what she's done, that remains as a very bad relationship. <laughs> her mom is insane. She is, but yeah, so she is. And Monica, um, you know, provided more anecdotes about how horrible their relationship is in addition to the montage that we saw right. of all of their- The montage was wild. I like had forgotten. I mean, I not forgotten because that was the main draw of the whole season, but watching it all back to back was crazy. It, yeah. And unedited, if you watched the uncensored version, watching them at that lunch where her mom calls her a motherfucker, I was like, Jesus Christ. It's very bad. And um in addition to that, which Andy is very sympathetic to yeah, Monica, I mean, which I was glad. And even the cast members, everyone gave her that. Like people didn't take that away from her and Whitney actually like totally doubled down on her own situation and sort of opened a conversation where everyone who has an estrangement yes. talked about their own. I was like, good, because just because she did what she did doesn't mean that this isn't real. Exactly right. Everyone gave her grace throughout that segment and really felt for her the entire time, Andy especially. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting the sense if I'm thinking about Andy, I do think he values Monica despite the reality von T's. He's you know, being hidden. super nice to her. Yeah. He, he's I like, really he's, feel like he's being overly nice. What? He's being overly nice. I, yeah. I mean, you could make the case that he's like, he's like allowing for what she wants to say. He's finishing her sentences. Sometimes he goes, he's saying something like, like when she's like in therapy, you can become another person or whatever. He's like, I totally understand that. Of mm -hmm. course. Like he is giving her even more than she right. needs for, for that segment. Yeah. At one point she's talking about, something horrible her mom did and Whitney's or Heather's like, how did you even film with her after that? And uh, she's like, I'm so used to it. It's like normal. And Andy's like, she, he's like, yeah, you're used to it. Like he's like really supporting her like more yeah. than anyone else. That's why it's like so ridiculous that I think Monica took this scorched earth approach after. Well, I think Monica, I haven't seen any news about what Monica has been doing now. Maybe she like stopped mm -hmm. talking, you know, outside of the Bravo forum or whatever, but Clearly, if you were watching Andy interacting with Monica from this reunion, you would say, yeah, he really loves Monica's presence and she's going to be back in season five for sure. Right. And even on the last part when she said that her business, her like Etsy business was shuttered because of COVID or whatever. And he's like, if you're going to sell stuff, you really need to do it right now. Like right. he was like, now's the time. Yeah. Like you should do it, which I feel like he never wants people to hawk their wares on the show. And he's like, you could be making like hundreds of thousands of dollars. Like, yeah. You need to do it. And then someone else said, <laughs> rightfully, they were like, I made a lot more money in COVID because that was when like people were buying right. shit all the time we were just for their bored, homes. And like, we were like, please deliver me and, something to look at. And you wanted your house to be like cozy and you wanted to just oh, yeah. like double down on all that stuff. So yeah, she could have. It didn't like, really make sense. Except I guess like fulfillment, maybe. I know that. But what does she make? Like crib sheets or something? Like <laughs> baby bundles? I don't recall. It was like talked about in the first episode and then it never... I think it was like swaddle blankets or something like I, that. I think she was going to make that business a part of her storyline if it if it came to that. Right, and because then that was post-COVID that she brought it up. Right. So I just think it was just a business that she thought she was going to have on camera and then flopped. And then they, didn't they talk about how like she had a lot of orders that she couldn't fulfill? And right. even Meredith was like, I bought stuff from there and I never got my order. Right. I know. I haven't uh, checked in on what she's doing, but I'm like, even if she just made the like something about her sweatshirt that said reality, I am reality Von Tees, she would have made a million dollars. Yeah. I just, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, why is Monica operating under the assumption that she's not going to be back? 
you will be back. Even if she wasn't, make the million, make the hundred thousand, whatever. Just go on like Zazzle.com and type in I am Reality Von Tease and sell it on your swipe up on your story. Like, are you serious? Yes, for sure. (laughs) Um, So Andy, we both agree, was giving Monica a lot of the benefit of the doubt. And then when Monica says, well, you think that's bad? Guess what else I have to say? Um, My mom actively, when I came back after my third audition and I thought I flopped like a fish, I I blew it in the audition. I yeah. came back and I talked to my mom and my mom said, let's let us pray together. <laughs> you know, dear Lord, uh, I know Monica flopped so horribly in her audition. So I think it would be so much better if I got the opportunity to be a <laughs> cast member. And, you know, everyone is horrified. Like, it's yeah, like, she goes, God, if it's not to be her, let it be me. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and everyone, I mean, that shocks everyone. Yeah. Like Andy's stunned. He's like, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> yeah. It was like insane. And like, uh, you know, she uh, reveals that when uh, she got, when she dropped her off when she was 12 or whatever, yeah. she went to uh, pursue her dreams in television in New York City. And Andy goes, well, she got on TV. Yes. Like he like hates the mom. You yes. can tell he's like horrified by yes. her. Yes. And then he, he talks about how her online um, assault against her daughter or her um, onslaught, her tweets about like, you know, giving all the behind the scenes shit and talking shit about Monica. Um, he also says that, do you think when your mom was at the Greek Easter brunch and she was trying to placate everyone and go around and like look better than you, that she was auditioning for the show. So yeah. he was even giving Monica that where it was like, it's fully validating Monica. Yeah. Um, but then did you see that Linda tweeted after the <laughs> no. reunion? So Linda said that the, the career she pursued it was in television, but she said that she's a journalist uh-huh. and that she wanted to be a producer on like a news, like for, for a news organization. So it was more about as part of her career and the way Monica made it sound was like she was trying to audition for a New York soap opera right. or whatever, you know, when yeah. she says television, you think she was trying to act, right. pursue acting. And then, oh my God, then she got her wish when she got on Salt Lake City. Right. But if you think about it in lines of Linda's career, which I'm taking everything Linda says with a grain of salt, yeah. I'm taking everything that Monica says with a grain of salt. Yes. But if you think think about it it's just part of her career it doesn't make it any less bad but it makes it less nefarious that it's like she wanted to be a celebrity right you know what i mean yeah for sure um and then also uh she said um and also everything that monica says is a lie or a half truth about when monica said um that my mom wanted to be on the show more than me or whatever she would have done anything to get on the show she linda posted messages from her and monica to twitter and uh Linda said, I don't want to be on the show. I will not sign a contract that says in perpetuity. And Monica said, I need you, mom. I need you on the show. This will be a great way to showcase our family and showcase our por- uh, uh, Portuguese heritage. Oh. So it's, again, deflating what Monica said. So you really don't know who to believe. Right. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. They're both a piece of work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is where she also reveals that um, when Monica brought her ex home, who became her husband that she was like in love with her boyfriend immediately and it had introduced her him to her mom and that her her mom immediately banned him from her house because she didn't want anyone in the house that was like more important than her a little bit like dd very dd vibes dd dd and also her whole family's from the bayou who gypsy rose her family's from the bayou so they're like dd on the bayou I love Bayou um, uh, culture. dialect and culture. <laughs> it's very unique. I think we've talked it about is unique. this. Well, in we the were past. saying how um, me and Jimmy, when we were watching the Gypsy Rose thing, it's her story is very similar to that of Bobby Boucher. Yes, overbearing mother. Exactly <laughs> right. It does sort of give Bobby Boucher. They're French, <laughs> right? Bayou is sort of French. Yeah, it's like what, I think an there's like of- a Caribbean element. Am I wrong? We shouldn't talk about this, <laughs> right? We, you and I, when we have to think about anything that's not Bravo, well, there's like we Creole, Creole. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, I was thinking New Orleans doesn't. Ha- it has a little. Oh yeah, yeah. It, well- <laughs> Our, our correspondent our might know. One of our producers <laughs> is telling us, no, 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 it's not Creole. Anyway, we're just talking about the French aspect to New Orleans. It is a, it is a French. Uh, offshoot right because they started out french and then but it's sort of like what happens when you have disconnect from your origin country a little yeah. bit but a lot of them still speak french so yeah they speak french down there. right yeah they came from you know like the louisiana territory so they lived in canada and then they actually moved down to louisiana like in the like beginning of the 
Okay. Okay. Yeah. 1800s, Louisiana Territory, Canada. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. They've been on the bayou for 200 years. That's amazing. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. So bayou that bayou culture. culture is really, yeah. We well, got to get down there. Yeah. Thank you. I was, I was Wikipedia. Yeah. We were watching oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I'm so glad. So yeah. So this, this bayou culture, which that is was sort of. our uh, <laughs> Lord Palpatine. Producer. Anyway, so they came down from Canada during the Louisiana <laughs> Purchase in, uh, in the 1800s. <laughs> no, um, 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 but anyway, well, what were we talking about? Why the, um, we talking about the Bayou? <laughs> well, yeah, we got off track. But this is when everyone starts chiming in. Like Whitney says, which, you know, was nice of her. She says, you know, sometimes you can't tell how manipulated you've, you have been yes. until you see it on TV. She said that's what happened to her with her dad that she had been estranged from her mom for like 16 years and that um, finally they've agreed to cut out the dad yes. and they could have a relationship. Then Heather says that she only texts her mom for Christmas and birthdays. Like that's right. their only relationship. Um, and so, yeah, I thought that was nice. Yeah. Um, me, me too. Um, and I could definitely see from that with my um, knowledge of Whitney's character that season five, if it starts with Monica, it is going to start with Monica talking to Whitney and Whitney saying, how can I help you navigate this next season? Because yeah. I will be there for you and I'm going to spurn Lisa and Heather and be on your <laughs> side and be the yeah. bridge to these two things. If that's a good strategic way for Whitney to get a powerful storyline, but I also don't doubt that she would do it because um, like, she just wants camera time and thinks that's a way that she could you know yeah she's definitely like the most calculated of the bunch for sure um then we get to monica eating it down the stairs um she ate shit right yeah they missed the moment camera wise well, but they were following her she's running away from her mom they're mm -hmm. trying to follow her down this hallway and then you hear the <laughs> clunk, 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 clunk 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 and can I tell you, it brought me back to when I fell down a oh, boat. Oh, no, and broke, I forgot about that. Broke one of my ribs oh. on the thing. It hurt so bad. I could not even imagine how oh. bad that hurt. Monica, um, she took a she took a turn at not knowing what, you know, what the future was. She, she was, you know what I mean? But it yeah. was, there was no handwriting. Not to code. Not to code. It's, it's awful. I get why they didn't put that in the show because it would have been like just not fun at yeah. all. You know, I mean. You know, originally they didn't put in the season. Right. Why they didn't show that footage. Yeah. She said that she had been crying so that she couldn't see, which right. I thought was maybe a stretch. Um, yeah. And then uh, apparently, you know, her legs were bruised up. Like, yep. it, And I saw, you know, she, showed, she showed it on Twitter, how, how fucked up her legs were. It looked bad. Um, and then apparently, so she left without her mom because she went to urgent care. And apparently production called her mom an Uber and she said, I'm not getting in that shit box because yeah. it was a Subaru. Right. <laughs> Andy was like, oh my God. <laughs> and then um, they were getting into a conversation about how litigious she is and that she threatened to sue Angie for having no uh, handrail. She said that I guess they were tweeting back and forth that uh, Monica said Angie should have paid for her head scan. But it turns out that production paid for her head scan, which I was like, Whoa, that's interesting. Very honorable of, of production to say that was like a work accident and yeah. we're fully paying for that. Yeah. Um, and then she implied that uh, Meredith told her that she could take Angie's house. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't doubt that Meredith said that. And if you're mad at Angie and you say some flippant remark like that, that you could sue them <laughs> for everything they're worth and get their house... I mean, yeah, why wouldn't Meredith well, say like that? It's like when she said, like, I could ruin anyone's life. Yeah, yeah I right. didn't mean that specifically. Yeah. I mean, it's just like, yes, yeah, she was clearly on Monica's side when she said that. She hated Angie. And in reality, I think you could sue someone for that if it wasn't Bravo taking on the responsibility for that. Right. So, and also Meredith, like, now everyone hates Monica, but she didn't at the time. So I don't understand why that's so egregious. It's like, yeah, you right. could have sued Angie. Yeah. And, and then they were accusing her of being, you know, having a lot of lawsuits or whatever. And she's like, who have I sued? Yeah. Who have she sued? How have I sued? And Heather's like, I mean, you're suing me. And she was like, that's a countersuit. <laughs> right. And then, yeah. And, and um, yeah, I mean, they, they really still, I guess they're going to get into that in part three. Because like, she really is countersuing because she doesn't want to pay her bills from right. beauty life. How do you get out of that? If you, you're, I mean, I guess she's going to say that it was botched is yeah, what she's going to say. Which... I mean, I, like it wasn't, right? I mean, we don't know. I mean, but yeah, I, like I feel like you would have had to take action to prove that first. Right. But, um, and then um, 
she gets into it with Lisa, who says that uh, she's like, Monica, you've been nasty all season. And then do you think Monica says, Touchette, Touchette. Do you think that she knows that it's Touche or yeah. is she going, is that just like no. a fun new way no, to say it? Because even if you've only seen <laughs> Touche written, it doesn't have a T, so you'd never think it was pronounced yeah, so that. so why is she it. saying it like that? I think that was maybe a fun way to say Touche, but it confused everyone and it confuses us. <laughs> so um, it wasn't, you know, good of her to say. It didn't make any sense. I was we like, sh- someone huh. should ask. Yeah. I um, thought it was a fun new way to say touche because everyone knows how touche is pronounced. You no one ever writes it. You only hear that said. Right. So I think it was a spin on the uh, you know a version of touche. Okay. Um and then there's like yapping for what felt like 3 straight minutes. Yeah. Lisa and uh, Monica Monica does not allow an argument to take place if she doesn't want it to, or she counters with sort of uh, really bad comebacks. If she gets to that place where she just wants to talk over someone, yell, Lisa eventually says, well, I know why your mom started talking to a tree while she was talking to you. Cause you <laughs> just can't get your point across with you. So I think that's, um, I think that is representative of how Monica handles fights. She just screams over you, says horrible stuff about you until you shut up and don't yeah. want to talk to her anymore. I kind of wished that they had just cropped that out. Yeah. Like it, it made it a, a jumble. I was yeah. like, I don't know anything you're saying because you're just talking over each other. Like but you they can let do it. that for like 15 seconds yeah. to show what had happened, but it went on and on and on. And I was like, can I like fast forward? Yeah. And that was on the editors and, and actually Andy in the room should have mm-hmm. said enough. We yeah. cannot hear you at all. Right. Um, then they go over. Andy asked her about her many names her um, catch me if you can identities Um, she has four names she clarifies that Darnell is her maiden name Fowler is her married name Delgado is her dad's side and Garcia is her mom's side and it turns out her mom changed her name at one point and dropped the Garcia and then she changed her name when she got married and then she changed it after her divorce Um, so she said basically she's changed her name three times It was when she got married. (laughs) And then when she, and then post-divorce, she didn't want to go back to Darnell. So she went to the dad's side. Right. And then she uses Delgado as a catch-all whenever she wants it. I I I don't don't know. It was kind of weird. I I don't, I like people are valid in asking why you have so many names. And she's valid for saying, I do a lot of shit with my name. It's like, I don't really care. The only thing that matters is that she used all a bunch of those (laughs) fake names to go into beauty lab and scam the system out of getting a bunch of free work with no bills. And then she accuses Lisa of apparently saying that um, she used her uh, other names to appear more Latina to get on the show. Yeah. And Lisa says that Jen is the one that said that, which actually that sounds more like something Jen would say for than sure. Lisa. I, I didn't even think for one <laughs> second that Lisa said that. Monica said it in a, a way to make it seem like Lisa would say something horrible like that, but it was totally Jen Shaw, I'm yeah. sure. And I believe Lisa's defense that she never said that. Totally. Uh, what did you think about Jack Barlow's visa debacle? I think it all, I'm, I'm Lisa pilled to a degree to where I don't really, I believe her most of the time. The only thing I don't believe her is her perception of the Mormon church, which we can get into later. But I agree that this was probably just a visa issue and they do do that with the OC and he wore a shirtless shirt and then he did get to Columbia. What kind of a moron sends a topless pick for their visa? I don't know. He was trying to be funny. You can't even like wear like glasses or like a headband yeah i mean you know he's an 18 year old 18 year olds are famously very dumb true their brain is not fully formed and he thought that was funny or he looked good in that photo and his mom didn't supervise and he it held him up for a long time you know it's i don't know i I don't look into anything like egregious in that or whatever but I, i do think that this then gets into the topic of the missionary trip mm-hmm. and um you know 
Heather really backed down here. Heather backed down, and you could say as a good friend to Lisa, like mm-hmm. she really earned her friendship with Lisa there because she could have made that such a bigger issue. I mean, this almost could have been a Shep-like moment where you break the fourth wall and talk about the horrors of the Mormon church and its origin. But Heather yeah. just said... She basically decided it wasn't worth it. She was like, whatever. Yeah. And then, um, so she. And then Whitney really rubbed it in. It was so annoying. Whitney then, knowing that Heather is purposefully um, couching her valid feelings and and feelings that Whitney should have as well, Mm -hmm. that Whitney is a hypocrite, that she's not bringing them up as well. Yeah. When Heather let down and just let Lisa have a moment that was not going to be making the Mormon church vilified, Whitney goes, yeah, so why the hell, you know, were you acting like that to me if this is how you feel? It's like, Whitney, she's purposefully not bringing this up because she doesn't want to ruin her relationship with Lisa, so you rubbing it in. She's like, so just so I'm clear, yeah. you're yeah. saying that you yeah. regret whatever. And it's like, just be chill. Like, she's obviously just trying to, like, let it go. Yeah. And also, I forget how Andy teased it up, but he, it was something like, so Heather, you know, can you explain to me why you felt, you know, left out of the Mormon thing or whatever, like, Mormon missionary trip? And Whitney goes, oh, I can't wait to hear this. Like, she's just waiting for Heather to have a downfall or do something horrible that she can, like, tell, you know, like, like uh, hold over uh, Heather's yeah. head forever. It's like she's just she she can't stand Heather's place on the show, and yeah. she wants to take her down in all these stupid subtle yeah. ways. I'm wearing my Heather Gay shirt yeah. right now. In honor so. of in honor of Heather, one of the best cast members of all time. Yeah. Um. And then so Mary is on her way out, and oh, she man. brings in um a real conversation about the church. Um. Yes. But first, on her way in, she greets Monica in the dressing room, which is a very strange duo yeah she reveals mary says she has not been watching and so of course monica's like hell yeah Yeah. (laughs) like she's like it's been crazy (laughs) right first of all monica's um like love of mary is completely put on and fake she only likes mary because mary has said good things about her yeah if if mary did one thing to her monica would go off on her to a degree to where mary would never forgive her like mary's loyalties make zero sense as a human being she is a quandary and you should if you only have mary on your side as a cast member you should question what you're doing wrong because mary is just that's not a good side to be on when meredith is like i love you i'm like she's not a good person to partner with no she's she is like well i don't want to say it actually too much <laughs> i'm just because I, I i'm going she's problematic so, i'm going so in on mary but like mary is a low level jen shaw jen shaw committed horrible horrible crimes but as a person mary is pretty bad on yeah. the scale of what you can do as a human i mean being be treated like a god in your church and stealing money from the congregants. i know I mean, i'm like are we just gonna ignore that you're not gonna tech you're not technically stealing but if you're rich from your congregation you're driving around in mercedes <laughs> and you have gucci pillows you're doing something wrong yeah. morally it's evil i it's, feel like it's weird that the show just i mean obviously she wouldn't participate anymore if they did get into it so she there's there's like four explicitly racist moments from Mary in either season two or three. Oh, that right. if you just showed those again, I think the world would be like, what the hell are uh, we doing on Mary's side again? I know. It's awful. I know. So anyway, I think like this scene sucked. I hate that Monica is using Mary to pretend like she loves her and like like Mary is an advocate for her. This is the most tenuous relationship ever. Yeah. Uh, Mary gives her a really shitty pep talk. Like you have your voice. Use it as if Monica isn't using her voice. Yeah. Um, I liked that Andy made her eat it right when she sat down and was like, it's great to see you at a reunion. Yeah. We missed you at the last one. Yeah. He, he like wants, that's the cardinal sin. Yeah. He, of wants all to make it so that, he wants to make it so that no one ever skips a reunion. That's like the one thing you can't do. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, she's going over who she likes at this time. Um, she likes Angie, Monica and Meredith. She said she used to like Heather until she heard her comments about her house. And she's like, you know, just so offended, even though they played it back and what she said was not bad at all. No, Heather was actively trying to give her true feelings about a very oddly decorated house, but keep it nice She was like, it's eclectic. eclectic. Yeah. yeah. It's like the best version of what you could have done when you see that house of horrors. Yeah. And then Andy's like, with all due, you called Heather inbred. Yes. And she's like, I still think the house comments were worse. So then that's it. Like, yeah, that's it. That's Mary in a nutshell. If you <laughs> think... Uh, Heather's commentary <laughs> about her doing the best version of saying you have weird style, eclectic or whatever, is worse than you calling someone that they look 
inbred, <laughs> then we never have to care about what you have to say about anything yeah. in, in, ever again. You yeah. just have a skewed perception of reality. Right. She also jokes that um, her son is bad in bed. And they talk about, first of all, she still doesn't know if her son is married or not. He's she's like 21 still, years old. She's still looking into it. If she could only find the paperwork <laughs> to find out if her son is telling the truth about being married, who lives in her house. Right. And then apparently she heard her son having sex loudly mm-hmm. and that his girlfriend he, uh, or she wife. She was loud. The, yeah. The girlfriend and or wife was really... Uh, Making loud sounds. So she walked in. And she was like, I don't know how long she stood there, what she saw, but she was basically saying, like, don't exaggerate. Like, make my son work for it. I was like, gross. So, (laughs) gross. Gross is an understatement. The fact that Mary thought that was an anecdote that was worth sharing just shows you what the hell else is going it's on a house in Mary's of horrors. house of horrors? What else is going on in Mary's life that she doesn't want to share with the world? That was just an anecdote that she was willing to share at the reunion. Yeah, like disgusting. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, and then um, they bring up uh, what Whitney had said about her being a predator, and uh, Whitney clarified that it was about religion and the church and not a sexual predator. Um, I, I think Whitney, if Whitney was, I, Whitney should just stood by and said, a predator in your church. You're taking advantage of people. Yeah, and she their totally faith. let go of that. No, she because she like didn't, it wasn't a hill that she wanted to die on. She like wasn't brave for a second. And then, but then I did like when Whitney, it showed her tweet and Whitney's like, this evil woman talking <laughs> about growth makes me sick. I was like, Whitney, that's the fucking energy. Yeah. Call Mary evil. Stick yeah. with that. You you are not going to be disappointed if you just, if that's the hill you die on, calling Mary evil. Like, yeah. Like everything I've seen of Mary that they want to show us is horrible. Yeah. But then uh, you mess with fire. You're going to get yep. burned. Mary immediately takes it to that uh, Whitney is racist. I mean, yeah. And Unambiguously. It- definitively 100 yeah. percent, she says whitney is a racist yep and andy says based on what and then she pivots and says based on their religion she immediately widens it to their religion so basically uh-huh. like saying that the mormon religion which whitney is no longer a member of right um and uh you know heather agrees that she says the mormon church is rooted in racism and lisa barlow's like no it's not yeah. no it's not and whitney's like yeah it is like everyone knows that yep. i uh listened to the book of mormon soundtrack and one of the lines is that in 1978 god changed his mind about black people because that was the first year that they were even allowed to be congregants like everyone knows that like i think it's written in um and even like lisa says earlier she's trying to defend like the lgbt yeah. of it all and uh she was like i don't know why people are calling out the mormon church because all most religions aren't nice to the lgbt community or whatever and i'm like why are you like you can just say like your family is yes. mormon and it's part of you know your culture and you participate in it for certain reasons but it has its problems yes. like why are you trying to ignore what everyone knows is problematic here's here's why lisa does not know enough about <laughs> the mormon church to have a valuable opinion to share about it she hasn't read the actual book of mormon (laughs) she talked about that earlier this season she goes to some distilled or or not distilled watered down version of the mormon church that she goes to every week that doesn't talk about any of the shit of their founding probably so when she defends the church it's it's ignorant yes and and i think she legitimately does not know that she is a part of a religion that has this racist explicitly racist founding right well she is immediately offended she's like does anyone want to ask me because immediately- I am, she goes i am a mormon yeah she's like why does anyone ask me and it's like heather knows so much more about the church than you like before and after That's right. no one wants to ask lisa about it like, like she was wearing the undergarments bitch like yeah. you're not wearing your mormon bloomers right now like and, shut up and it's it's <laughs> it's something that like when they get into this it's like like this is real like the you know like this is real them grappling with the mormon church and the fact that lisa doesn't know and heather does know like i don't know and I, even whitney will finally this is one place where she will be like yeah that is. is why the church is bad and that's part of why i left or whatever yeah. um and then but then mary backtracks and says i don't have a problem with the church and right. i'm like 
But you said that that's why she's racist is because of the church. So how do you have a problem with Whitney who left the church, but not with the church itself? Right. No, I mean, it, 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 it goes from a five alarm fire to being Whitney is explicitly a racist to why are you calling her that? Well, it's because of the church, but I actually am fine with the church. I don't have any problem with them. And then Whitney goes, just to clarify, Mary, since you just labeled me a racist. (laughs) Actually, actually, I think Whitney, I mean, you know, I I, I don't want to get too like personal or whatever, but like if I was called explicitly a racist at a reunion that was, you know, recorded right i would not handle myself well i would be so upset it's like the worst thing of right. course you could be labeled whitney actually goes um so <laughs> mary when you say that about me she goes is there anything that i specifically did to you or that i said to you that yeah. was racist and mary goes no yeah well there's a moment right before that where it gets a little dicey where right. um <laughs> whitney's like i am a white woman of privilege and mary goes like speak on it like right. she starts to be like yeah, you're full of shit. Like, I don't want to hear it kind of a thing. And I'm like, oh God, oh God. Yeah. No, no, no. It got, it got <laughs> dicey. I mean, no, the minute that Mary said definitively on camera that Whitney's a racist, I was like, oh my God, where the hell are we going here? Yeah. But I think it's just because people's view of Mary, the fact that this isn't the most explosive moment that is talked about for days after, it's just because Mary said it and no, like people don't really value what Mary says. Well, yeah. Cause she like goes like she immediately backtracked on it. Yeah. Um, and then she goes, uh, I love that Andy was like, what did you think about the reality of uh, reaction from the group or whatever? And she goes, I thought it was a little much. <laughs> <laughs> like she was like, who cares? <laughs> and she yeah. goes, uh, they're like, would you care if uh, that account said mean things about you and called you a dumb bitch and all this stuff? And she's like, not really. Yeah. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> And I'm Seriously. like, you literally just like annihilated Heather for saying that your decor was that you had big, different. That you had big pillows on your chairs. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. It's um yeah, I, I um my the comedic relief that Mary offers does not outweigh how horrible of a person she is in my yeah, mind. Yeah, she like and actually scares me. Like yeah. I feel like they're playing with fire. Yes, exactly right. Keeping her around because I'm like, I think like something like really fucked is gonna come out go of to that. her church one more time yeah and spend another day at her church and put that on on camera and let us see what the hell is actually going on there they yeah. did it once and no one ever wanted to go back there again it was yeah too... they played around with that they had that like mole or like that guy who explicitly yeah. said that he was like that gave her like, like yeah 20 grand or whatever and they kind of dropped that um so i no, don't know it's... i'm kind of curious about people that like stan they stand. Mary, they I'm stand like, the comic relief. Huh? They they love that she's brave. Those people hate Lisa and Heather, so they love that someone like stands up to Lisa and Heather. Um, but it's like just show a montage of Mary's worst moments, and I'd like to see someone watch that and then defend her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, so yeah, next week. Well, uh, at one point they're talking about reality Vontees, and uh, I was watching the unedited version, so it caught my eye when there was a bleep. It was because Monica named someone else who yeah. was Reality Von Tees. And I'm like, will we ever know? Or is are they going to keep that a secret? Yeah, I mean, I, it's great that she wants to say it's a collective or whatever. But I, it doesn't really uh, lessen the impact that you were one of them. Right. I don't. What does it matter? No. You were part of a group of trolls. It's the yeah. exact same thing. Yeah. And then so next week they're saving the Black Eye, the Burn Book, which now seeing that it's on part three means that... Uh, it wasn't in cahoots with Mean Girls because that movie will have been out for a long ass time by the time the burn book comes no, out. No, it's just <laughs> something. Uh, I think that was a reference that perfectly aligned with Monica's, you know, I don't know. She's like my same age or whatever. So it was yeah. probably impactful. She and did she a good job making it. It looked like a prop. I was thinking it was a prop from the original film. Yeah, she snuck into the prop house. Yeah. Um, and then they uh, get into the fact that she stalked Jen and that she's the one who installed Jen's security cameras. So she just had access and maybe that's where she gets all of her secret quotables. Yeah. That's one of those Is things. Is that illegal? Yeah, of course. Of course. That's one of those things where you think it's going to be fun when you install a ring camera in your friend's house and you get to watch them do all this stuff. And then when it's said out loud, it's the worst thing you've ever heard in your life. I don't um, want footage of anything. I don't have any ring cam or like, you know, no. some people have them for their pets and stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to know anything. 
I've, I think I've already said this maybe on the Patreon, but like if I saw what my dogs were doing when I was alone <laughs> at the movies watching a three hour Napoleon movie that I wasn't even enjoying that much, and yeah. I saw my dog cry at the camera and like play with a toy and no one played back with him, I would like race out of the theater. I, I don't, know. it's too sad for me to think about what yeah. they're doing. That's like our friend who has a baby. I like babysat for her one night when, um, the baby was asleep and I didn't have to do anything and there was a baby monitor and I was like do you have like an app on your phone where like you can check on the baby monitor she was like no I would be like my life would be ruined like I can't have that and I was like good I get it I get it too (laughs) and we wouldn't want to see I mean you think it's going to be fun putting uh, you know a ring camera in your friend's house and you get to watch them when they're not they don't know you're watching, but it, you would see some horrible stuff. <laughs> nose picking. Nose picking, <laughs> scratching, <laughs> them cursing out loud for no reason, <laughs> talking to themselves, muttering. You don't. we get enough of what we see of everyone and we don't need more. Yeah. That's why you got to give the Summer House cast credit for when those CCTVs, yeah. are, or sorry, what, what the, yeah. the security systems that are in their cameras are in their room, they must have to edit around a lot of weird stuff that goes on there that they don't want nightmare. on camera. I know. I actually just got a new doorbell uh, put in and it's just a normal doorbell, like a classic regular ding dong doorbell yeah. that connects to the original oh. vintage oh, cool. doorbell. I want to ring and it. And you should. Uh, and... I tried to do it myself and then it became complicated. So I hired it. I treated myself to a task rabbit and the guy was like, oh my God, I never install a regular doorbell. It's always a ring. He was like, I love this. Really? It's like just a classic doorbell. Do you think he was just buttering you up to get a tip? <laughs> I did give him a tip. He was, sorry, Jimmy. He was hot. Really? You yeah. had a hot, hot man install. Yeah, uh, he was wearing Crocs. <laughs> That is awesome. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I love that you got an old fashioned door. Yeah. You'll have bell. to take a look. It's really cute. It says press on it. I wish I could ding it right now, but it would take too much effort for me to get back in my <laughs> yeah, seat. We're so we'll pinned do it back by we'll, our microphone. We'll do it another time. Um, so yeah, I think that, I think that that is that um, alone that Jen had, or sorry, that uh, Monica had access to Jen's nighttime Scandalous. footage is bad. <laughs> Very I bad. hope it's like, um, black light or what's it called like um when it's like night cam yeah like oh. green and yeah. it's like jen with like beady green eyes yeah. like I hope it's scurrying like, around her house being hope, like fraud them <laughs> i hope it's like blair witch and you see all of a sudden it was where did jen shaw go and they peek around the camera and jen shaw's just hovering in the corner just looking at one of the corners it's of like her time house lapse entire- like paranormal activity <laughs> where she's just like like moving very slightly over the course of many hours. Monica goes, I did look in one time at the footage and what <laughs> I saw horrified me beyond belief. You must never watch this. <laughs> <laughs> That's like a grizzly man. Yeah. You remember? You must never watch this. Uh, burn this footage now. <laughs> I, I think that was, uh, Werner shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Too sad. I think Werner. He rubbed it in. Uh, no, 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 no. It was, no, it was rightfully sad. I just think that Werner should have, I don't think he should have put his fingers on the scale and, and made that person um, imagine how bad it was. No, 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 no. Oh. He's, he, he tells them to d- delete the footage oh. of Timothy Treadwell getting eaten by a bear. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you're I saying think, that he should have let them keep it. Well, he's a documentarian and you're really not supposed to um, delete footage. Delete footage, first of all, <laughs> that's one of the cardinal rules and also influence the outcome of your documentary. Mm-hmm. You're not, this doesn't supersize me. Well, that's why it was such a pivotal moment because you're like even he who is trying to make a juicy movie uh whether or not that was his goal for it to be juicy but he wanted uh, it to be juicy as hell (laughs) because i got a juicy one for you he crossed the line and said i'm stepping in we cannot let you watch this so he didn't really want like a faces of death type uh thing going right on, like he you... was like this is a bridge too I agree. far when i can't I was allow young, it when i was young and i originally watched that i thought it was neglectful of him not to include that but now i realize you're right we don't have to hear timothy Treadwell humanity get... yeah it was his humanity yeah and it was that same humanity that made him look upon baby yoda with such <laughs> um mist or majesty right yeah uh, I love that. Um, okay. Well, he said he loves reality TV also. Werner said that? Yes. He said he, he loves, loves rea- wrestling and uh, reality TV, like trash TV. He said, um, what did he say? He, he said that like basically that we must watch what like culture has to offer. It was something like, it was like wow. the poet cannot be blinded or something like it was like we must take in what we have 
You know what? I agree with him, and that's why we do what we do. Exactly. We're the poets <laughs> sent to decode. Yeah. It's like um, contact. They should have sent a poet. Exactly. They sent us. We <laughs> are who the aliens sent instead of Jodie Foster to report on the Bravo universe, right? Yeah. They sent us to Sir and Tom Tom. We're the perfect people at the perfect time to be reporting on Bravo. I think so. Okay. It's just... You heard it here first. We said a compliment about ourselves. <laughs> it was like, I watched um, Orange County, starting Orange County since 2004, whenever it was on, preparing all this time. And then finally I got laid off just in yep. time for Scandaval and needed an outlet. And it it's uh, Beshert. It is so beshert, and um, I wanted to ask you just to button up this conversation. Actually, no. I think we should sit. I was just going to ask what's what would Werner's, Werner's favorite Bravo show be, but we can maybe just think about I that. I bet it would be something like niche. Like it would be like family karma. Yeah. Yeah. I could imagine that. Well, we'll ask him. Um, yes. We have him set to be interviewed on a future Turtle Time. So Love that. that I hope nice. he comes over. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, between uh, us Verner, and our we'll, socks. Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll move our feet. Sorry, Werner. Um, I think some people are like freaked out that we don't wear shoes. Um, who? But I'm like, who? I don't know. There was maybe it was just one comment in all of history, but they were like, no shoes. I'll say this: <laughs> everything that Amy and I do in this this uh, version iteration of Turtle Time is permissible. It's Amy and I sitting on Amy's couch in the middle of the day. Yeah, what do you trying... want me to get like shit shoes on my couch? <laughs> you want me to walk in with my shoes from God knows where and put them on Amy's couch, or sit forward, not look at each other? This is this is how it has to be until we get that wonderful, beautiful <laughs> recording studio that you know we're getting yeah. in 2024. I mean, I know for our YouTubers and our TikTok and Instagram viewers that our videos could look so much better, but guess what? I don't want to buy a new camera. I don't want to buy lights. This I want to put my old iPhone that I have yeah. on a little shitty tripod from yes. Amazon and that's what we're gonna have until we have money. Yeah, this ain't this ain't a Werner Herzog documentary <laughs> where you we have all the production budget in the world. This is a scrappy indie documentary of a kind I don't even know what the hell that would be. You're gonna get an iPhone 10 eight feet away <laughs> that I cut the clips in half and have a Riley square and an Amy square. And that's that. <laughs> but 2024 is looking up. I did think we were po possibly going to get on the Ringer Network, but I just realized they just got a podcast called Spidey with Heidi and Spencer Pratt, oh. where they talk about reality TV. So I think that might have mm. took it, taken the market from us a little bit. But okay. anyway. Um, I think um, Bobby and Lindsay from Who Weekly were on that podcast, and they said that they were really nice and that it was when they were visiting LA and they were leaving the studio and they were saying that they were going to their friend Lala's house. And Heidi was like, Lala Kent? And they were like, imagine if we knew Lala Kent and wow. that's where we were going. She was like, well, I don't know. Yeah. She was like, I don't know your life. Yeah. I don't know your life. <laughs> well, yeah. Legitimate question. I don't know your life. That's great. Okay. Um, well, we have one minute to talk about Beverly Hills. Uh, Can we do it in 30 seconds? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. Here, here's high level. Really quick. I'll just go through it. Yeah. Um, esophagus gate continues. It's yes. horrible. Everything that Anne-Marie is doing revolving around Sutton's esophagus is bad and wrong. She's even on making Crystal look like a shining star because she is so bad on the show. Yes. She's letting Crystal have a glorified moment. The first in three seasons. I know. Maybe that's but, her whole purpose. I mean, if it took this long and Crystal just had to have an absolute foil that she looked great up against, I'm fine with it. I mean, this Crystal is handling herself well. Well, she called her a bitch <laughs> and marie tried to say that crystal accused sutton of having an eating disorder when, right. they, when Anne that marie specifically wild. brought that I'm up i'm like you know that was on camera right yeah right <laughs> and marie is floundering the worst i've ever seen it yeah. it's like bottom rung performance as a as a cast member yeah. I mean, you can't get much worse can i tell you quickly what happened to me when uh i sat down to watch last night i had it <laughs> recorded and there were two episodes and I just, I was like quickly chose the one that was first and I was like, that's it. And, uh, it's, a, it was like a conversation between like Crystal and, uh, who was it? Was it Sutton? I don't remember. But, uh, and Crystal's talking about her 
eating disorder and there's like a mention of homeless not toothless and then someone says I met up with Lisa last night and I was like Lisa who and I was like what and then I was like I was like are you gonna show me a scene where what you say which Lisa you're talking about like Rinna like what and then it shows uh, Crystal talking to Rinna and Diana and I was like what the fuck and then it cut to commercial and it showed them all with their um, diamonds and Diana and Rinna were in the thing. And I was like, season, I was like, episode 14 reveal. Like, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, and right. then I checked the guide and I was like, this is season 12. <laughs> that's great. It's, it's so wild that it took that long because they're talking about homeless, it's, not toothless. It was and the it's same. Crystal. It was yeah. like eating disorder and homeless, not toothless. And I was like, well, that's what we're talking about. I thought you were going to say there's some commercial in the commercial credits that was from the <laughs> past. Yeah. And it was like, it's it was like, like from like the 80s. Yeah. It was like, there's never going to be a thing called COVID. And you're like, whoa, this is from the, the uh, way in the past. But, but I was like, I assume that they programmed the episode before the new right. one to be the homeless on two those episodes right. to give us context right <laughs> yeah but i literally it took me 10 minutes to realize that something wasn't right yes uh and i had a whole mental breakdown and even like texted multiple people the photo it made me feel yeah. like real dumb and i was like well, i'm not even drunk well, so i was at the premiere <laughs> and i got a text from you showing the title card with the diamonds circling <laughs> diana and lisa and, I, and you said what and i was like what the hell happened on Beverly Hills that is making Amy like <laughs> go back? <laughs> like, t- or, or like what's happening on Beverly Hills that is like making them reshow the title card for old Beverly Hills. I was like, this must be a big deal. I'm like a moron. <laughs> no, it's not your fault. They had to show the prequel to this episode so that we knew what the fuck home was not to this was. So that's, I that's was like, to- there's no way they would bring Diana back. Yeah. And then finally, it like snapped. <laughs> Diana, Diana's like, hey, did you miss me? And everybody's like, no. It snapped me out of it when it showed her yeah. like 20-year-old boyfriend playing the piano. I was like, no, 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 no. no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> this can't be real. This can't be real. Um, it was like a nightmare. I got a glimpse into hell. So I will say the homeless on Toothless, I mean, we're, we're, we're spinning yes, fast here. Yes. Homeless on Toothless, this was a full fan service moment. I don't think this thing was actually real. I feel like this was only <laughs> to bring back up the one powerful moment from last season so they right. have a full gala dedicated to it but there's no evidence that this actually did anything in the community or the charity all right. they had was i mean tape. that was a pricey event though at the beverly hilton i'm sure it went there but i think that this was a fully bravo sanctioned event just to bring homeless not right. toothless back into the because the way they're like laughing about it i know being it was like borderline it. uh distasteful yeah, this time was. around it, Right. It's like it's like you guys are laughing about an organization that tries to keep the teeth in homeless people's mouth. It's not that funny. I know. It felt like the first time it was funny because it was like they really couldn't get it straight. Yes. And it's like at this point, I'm like, I understand why it's still funny, but it felt a little bit like, all right, guys. No, it, it, it was it was fan service. And, yeah. the, and they knew that the only good moment from last season, for the most part, was the homeless, not toothless thing. And that was like Kathy <laughs> centric. Totally you know, she, Kathy. Yeah. So they're trying to piggyback off a off a great moment from last season and make it a full thing right did you like when dorit said that about pk what's on his lung is on his tongue loved it and have you heard that before no and it's moments like that that i wish we could actually give this edit you know more of its due because that was fun i thought mauricio was being kind of um it was very sad them going to the event you know talking about how distant they were that was awful Mm -hmm. and um they really make more of a um a big deal out of the fact that mauricio could have done something to get to the celebration of life and then Mm -hmm. even i think garcelle or sutton says you came to homeless, not toothless, but you couldn't go to the celebration of life. Right. So, um, but then I thought Mauricio's behavior as he was on the red carpet and stuff was kind of funny. He was yeah. saying a lot of like silly <laughs> he jokes. He kept goofing around and Kyle was like, stop it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we can blow past Crystal had lunch with her brother and they try to make that a thing that was the end of that storyline i'm I'm, i hope i'm I'm assured well he's like moving away it it was (laughs) it was crystal bye your brother your storyline's moving that's what it was (laughs) that was the end they tried to make that something and it ended i also liked when rob said "Uh, i have to go to an event before homeless not toothless i'm doing a screening of the brave little toaster did you hear that (laughs) I missed that. Yeah, he's, you know, he's so animate in the animation world. And I guess for some reason they were doing a celebration of the Brave Little Toaster. But I looked and he had nothing to do with it. So huh. it was maybe... Just out of enthusiasm, maybe it, friends with the filmmaker. Friends with the filmmaker, I think. I don't think I can watch that movie because I already struggle with... Um, 
what's that called? Anthropomorphizing um, inanimate I, objects. I knew that was one of your struggles. Yeah, I can't fuck with like a sad little abandoned toaster. I can't because I have a, this. I've had the same toaster since my first apartment. And sometimes I'm like, it would be nice to have a new toaster. And I'm like, I can't. That's too sad. Yeah, I felt that way about my, my Honda Element that I had oh, for yeah. 12 years. I really felt like I was getting rid of a thing with a soul. Yeah, when I got rid of it. Jimmy got a new car in 2023 and he still hasn't sold his old car because it's too sad (laughs) yeah but i just you have to believe if you have trouble with that just believe that whatever soul was in your honda element or for me personally it leaped out and went into my honda fit you know what i mean (laughs) and then you just get to think about it the same way like my honda transference soul transferred to my honda fit okay and that's how i move past it yeah so you're right okay brave little toaster good (laughs) thing we talked about that um yeah it's all esophagus um I liked that um, pink lady that was at the event that um, Erica took a photo with. I think she should be a cast member. Yeah, I loved her too. But what did you think about how um, uh, there was a reason why Erica wanted to take a photo with pink lady and it was kind of sweet. And then Garcelle said, I want to take a photo with you too. Is it just going to be pink ladies? And then Garcelle was just in their photo they were going to take together because they're wearing pink. <laughs> right. I didn't really it was just understand. like two like six feet tall women next to like a four foot five <laughs> old woman. Yeah. Um, Paula Abdul was there. Taylor Dane performed. And I like Erica Taylor. was stoked. I like Taylor Dane's performance. And yeah, I good. love when they get the rights to actual music and have the artists yeah. sing. This is the second time this season they've gotten the yeah. rights to music. What was it? Tell it to my heart. Ah. Tell me I'm the only that was, one. That was good. And then Anne Marie was like, I don't know who she is. And I was like, get out of here. Yeah. Horrible. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And then, yeah. Uh, after Crystal gets fired up um kyle's like i didn't know she had that in her and garcelle was like me either and i was like this is last chance you know last chance for personality i mean if crystal doesn't make some moments happen towards the end of this season there is no chance of a fourth season for crystal but i will give it to her if you just saw these scenes and you didn't know crystal's history i would you'd say she's a pivotal member of the cast bringing it to Anne marie but this is like the first occasion where I've really been on Crystal's side in a conflict. Yeah. And then my notes for the whole rest of the episode is just a series of FaceTime or phone calls. There's Kyle calls Sutton, uh, calls Anne Marie, Crystal calls Erica, Garcelle calls Sutton, Anne Marie calls Sutton. And you already rightfully pointed out that that is a lazy maneuver to make cast members have scenes without actually getting them together. And it's being overutilized on this season of Beverly Hills. And I think you're 100% right. Yeah. Um, And so basically, Anne-Marie has to give a half-ass, but ultimately whatever, apology to Sutton so that she can go to Barcelona, um, which they tease that they might be staying in a haunted establishment. I like that. I'll take it. If that provides a little (laughs) bit of life to this season of Beverly Hills. I mean, we've... You and I, I'm just going to end this final thoughts. We've really, I think... Our estimation of this season has dropped so hard since the first. I know. Three I feel episodes. like when we were stoked at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, I was with you where it's just fun to have Beverly Hills back in our lives, and it was fun to like get back in with this group like and what Kim. they're doing. Kim was great, but it's like it's they they are treading water, and the fact that I think I have to assume when Andy saw Esophagus Gate coming up after a fourth episode. He's like, what the hell happened here? How did you let this go on for that long? And Anne-Marie is a real housewife. She had a tagline. Yes. Yeah. Hers was, um, oh, I wrote it down because I wanted to ask you about it. Was um, it like? It's, it's, um, it's, I may put you to sleep for a living, <laughs> but I always keep one eye open. And I thought, you put people to sleep. <laughs> but you keep one eye open when it should you're putting be like, them to sleep? It should be like, I might put you to sleep, but you better keep one eye open. Yeah. Well, I, am I just wrong that that doesn't make any sense? No, it flip-flops. But, but how could they let a tagline go out that doesn't make any logical sense? <laughs> I may put you to sleep for a living, because she's a yeah. nurse, an anesthesiologist or whatever. Yeah. I may put you to sleep, but I always keep one eye open while I'm putting you to sleep. <laughs> right? Am I wrong? Yeah. It should have been like... I know about slim esophagus, but I won't swallow your bullshit. That, you've already said you already said a better version of this one off the top of your head. That esophagus one would also be so good. If anyone can decipher what this means, if it actually makes sense, but if not, bravo, how are you letting taglines go out into the world that just don't make sense? I mean, Crystal's doesn't make sense. Crystal, I'm 
people say you get smarter as you get older, but I'm proving them all wrong. <laughs> yeah. It's like Everyone's like, does that mean you're dumb? Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I could put you to sleep, but you better keep one eye open. That'd be better. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, I couldn't believe it. I hadn't heard that before. And I'm like, does this just not make sense? Anyway, um, <laughs> Beverly Hills, we really did not, we did not. There was nothing there. Recap. Be real. Homeless, not toothless. And Anne-Marie calling Sutton's esophagus small. Um, it's not a good season. And Mm-mm. I think like Atlanta, if people were really down in Atlanta, this cast may need a shakeup. And yeah. Anne-Marie is definitely not what you need for the future of Beverly Hills. Yeah. I will say uh, getting a, a glimpse into a reality where Rinna and Diana were back wasn't good. <laughs> oh, oh no. I mean, yeah, that was a horrendous <laughs> season last season. Diana Jenkins, I stand by, was the worst casting decision they've ever made. Even Anne-Marie. At definitely worst. top five top five yeah yeah um okay well we are past the i think the longest episode potentially or in the <laughs> realm of the longest i can't believe it happens every single week we more can't and more. What? shut up yeah we love talking <laughs> i think just to give us a self-assessment I, I i don't remember anything we said but i feel like we touched on <laughs> a lot of stuff you've right? been here for four hours <laughs> sitting in this <laughs> like anyway well i think i hope this was a good episode i hope it's um par for the course or even better than you know what yes. total time can bring yes um and if this wasn't enough for you as you know we are on patreon recapping vanderpump rules from the beginning and we have that BravoCon special where we talk about every single interaction we had with every single bravo liberty including many with shep and austin um, vicky avery singer um <laughs> yes. only, i mean a the lot slc of women pa- yeah going to Paige's birthday at hakasan also just search BravoCon and patreon patreon once you pay us five dollars <laughs> and there's also a beautiful BravoCon vlog that's 47 minutes of all the it's proof true. of everything that we're saying it's a good yeah it's a good little vlog. it's like one of our best uh weeks of content that you know, yeah. our recaps are fun, but that was um, yeah. specialty. And Amy, uh, Amy and I are planning on doing more stuff like that, you know, for the Patreon community. Not that we don't give them our Villa Rosa <laughs> VIPs enough, but we plan on making more special content like that. So join the Patreon. I think it's fun. And then also, if you love Turtle Time, but you've never poked your little turtle head out <laughs> to review us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, please do, because every review we have is like the best written, almost Shakespearean, rhapsodic <laughs> uh, review of our podcast. And I love yeah. it so much. And that helps us tremendously. So that would be great. Exactly. Um, yeah. Any support is appreciated. And we will see you next week. And that will leave us, I think we're only two weeks away from uh, Vanderpump. It's going to be here before we even know it. I can't believe it. I mean, we're just this, we're in the Vanderpump Rules era right now. And you and I are, it's going to change our lives best days of our lives exactly all right we love you so much go to sleep now and we'll see you next week bye this one's for you tonight